Okay, hey folks, how's it going? Uh, quick audio check. We'll get started here uh, as we are going live now. Um, let me just make sure everything is in place that we need. Uh, remote, I think, is working for Zoom. Just filled the pin up with ink. Pin the message in the chat about the materials that I'm using today. Uh, and today is just a session on being able to just share, um, obviously, sketching and drawing, being able to, you know, advise, talk, chat, interact. And of course, talk a bit about even some of the things that are happening for me next week. For those of you that are going to be joining in on classes, uh, you'd be welcome to. And for those that are interested, if you want to talk about that, the experience of taking classes online for art and design, uh, we can discuss that as well, too. So hopefully everyone is doing well. Uh, welcome for those of you that are joining for the first time. Uh, these live streams, I tend to just jump on, pop up once in a while. Uh, and, and usually I kind of post it on my, uh, my Instagram stories. 15, 20 minutes prior to actually beginning. So if you're looking for interaction, uh, certain questions I try to answer towards are relegated towards the focus on what we're discussing now. Uh, if there are questions that are a little bit obscure or off topic, then I sometimes will skip over it. Do my own moderation, essentially. Uh, if I skip over a question, I just tend to miss certain things because of the stream of the chat. I will try to go back and read it again. But if I happen to miss it and you want to ask it again, don't hesitate to do so, please. So anyways, um, again, welcome towards uh, sketching with me today. If you're gonna be drawing with me, uh, please have your materials out. You know, any sort of materials, pens, paper, that sort of stuff. Today, what I'm using right now is I have my uh, fountain pen. This is a Estra Brook pen, uh, which was, I bought myself as a personal part of collection. Uh, this is a F nib. So with fountain pens, I prefer fountain pens due to the fact that I can refill them. The ink that I'm using today is just a Sailor ink. This is one of many other kind of inks that I use. I also use this one here. This is a Pilot uh, bottle of ink. This is just an empty box. I also then have the Carbon ink made by Platinum. So I've been testing out multiple different inks just to see which I like to just play with. And some of them are better for fountain pens because they're more water soluble. So they're less harsh, uh, especially if they tend to dry out or if you let the ink sit in your pen for too long, which is not, not ideal, but can happen here and there. Um, this one's a bit more mineral based, a lot more pigment. And so with this one, if you let it sit in the pen, it can, you know, gunk it up a little bit there. So it is still flushable. Um, this one I've used for many years and I've had no real big issues, but, uh, still this one is more for when I do things like watercolors, any sort of like additional, you know, um, traditional mediums on top of my ink. I don't want it to bleed or run or, or smudge. Uh, this one, as it dries out, will bind better to the paper, having less actual, um, uh, smudging or running but these ones over here once you put water on top of it even if it's dry sh will most likely pick it up so today because I am using this ink I'm not gonna be doing any sort of watercolor work mainly just black and white line uh, anyways let me put these away so that's the kind of ink that I'm using today this paper right now that I have in front of me uh, is an Italian paper made in uh, it's a certain type of paper made in a region, Italy, and they call it the Amalfi paper. Uh, this one comes from a company called Amatruda. I found it online. I just Googled it. Uh, so that's, it wasn't a recommendation. I just was looked for it myself, and I bought a ream of it. I think like 70 sheets. And this is in about almost by 11 by 14, 11 by 17 almost. And I just bought a giant stack and imported it from Italy. So it wasn't cheap, and I don't necessarily recommend it for just anybody just to practice on sketching. But for those of you that are paper enthusiasts, uh, stuff like this can be interesting. Uh, but in any case, uh, if anybody has any questions and stuff like that, you are welcome to ask at any time. Other than that, what I plan to draw, I mean, I don't really have a plan essentially just yet. I'll kind of think of it as we go today. I was going to relate it towards something in, in regards to the Chinese New Year's. So maybe some kind of possible dragon thing because it is the year of the dragon. Uh, so, you know, it won't be super difficult to draw, but I would like to be able to play with it as some sort of action or movement that makes it at least a bit more visually interesting for me and a bit more challenging in that sense of being able to combine multiple elements together. So I thought about some kind of dragon, but also being used almost like a puppet with characters and they're kind of like, you know, uh, using it like a di uh, the dragon dance or lion dance kind of thing um, in sort of celebration to it, I guess. But uh, as we go through, who knows what will happen? We'll just kind of add and mix and do a bunch of different stuff as we go along. And I'm sure others will ask about this as we continue on through the day uh, about our subjects, our materials. So for those of you listening from the very beginning, uh, do understand I tend to repeat myself quite a bit because of constant questions that are, you know, oncoming. Uh, so to start off, uh, Jet has a question, which is, um, may I say this already, but will this live stream be posted on my channel? So anytime I do a live stream right now, 
uh, it will always be then saved out, posted onto the the channel itself, and uh, you can watch it again. I believe the chat uh, also takes a bit of time to process, and it will then be also on the part of the, the watching stream, so you can well not the live stream, but you can watch it again as a video, and the the chat window should be up there. So you guys, if you want to read questions and stuff like that, uh, it'll be there as well too. But I tend to always read the questions before I answer them. Uh, just so that people that are listening in will know in context to what I'm uh, answering. Okay, so what I want to do first is um, before I sketch and draw anything, uh, a lot of it is just people always ask that big question is, do I already know what I am going to draw and what it's going to look like on the piece of paper here? And I do not. Okay, so uh, in this particular case right now, I don't have a direct image in my head. We have the idea. And I always mention this every time we go into that question, which is, you know, that process of visualization. Uh, do I have something in mind? I have an idea. The idea, of course, was, again, the Year of the Dragon. So I do want to draw a dragon of some type, but I influx this idea, this concept of a puppet uh, being used by these characters and maybe floating through the air or something like that. Kind of like the lion dance sort of thing. Uh, so I'm going to have the dragon appear somewhere floating through the air, maybe in this kind of like S-curve. And I want there to be individual people, characters that kind of have their arms in the dragon. And they're maybe like manipulating it in some ways. I don't know exactly what it's going to look like. Um, I have, for some reason, had flashes of thoughts of something even mechanized. I don't know how that's going to work. We'll see. <laughs> uh, welcome. Um, for anybody else that's also here from different parts of the country. So, you know, I'm sure a lot of you guys are in different time zones and whatnot. So some of you might be early in the morning. Some of you in the late at night. But either way, welcome again to join in. So right now what I'm doing is talking to you guys about what's literally going through my mind. So there's no direct image, but there are flashes of thoughts and ideas, okay? So dragon up here somewhere, floating through the sky, characters like here, here, here. How many? I don't know just yet. But there's going to be one in the foreground. In this mentality or this thought process, I'm thinking about where do I want to command most of the attention. So I probably put it towards the front, obviously, you know, as the dragon's coming towards the viewer, you guys, uh, and the main character or the person, individual, manipulating the dragon, which would be about right about here. So even though I'm kind of generally placing things in my mind, I don't know exactly what they look like, okay? So it's just more of like a placeholder, uh, more of an idea again as to what I'm trying to do. So within this, what I also, what I tend to do is kind of place in landmarks. Think of it like destinations on a map. So little dots of things that tell you where things could possibly be in location. So for instance, I could say there's a, there's a dot I'm gonna place right there, which you can maybe not see right now on the camera, but I'll put a dot there for the time being. And that tiny little dot, which you can't see, but it's right there, uh, is a landmark for me to know that that's going to represent a location of something. And what that's going to uh, represent is the end of the nose for the dragon, okay? So it'll be right there. And then from that, as we go through all the way around, a portion of the body as it turns in some sort of serpent-like way will turn right about here. So I place in a dot there and a dot right there. So these two dots obviously have no association to each other in terms of, let's say, um, like anatomy or construction, but it is giving me distance. So I can then fit things in between, knowing that from the head goes into the body turning this direction at that point of junction, and it'll continue down this way. Character will be about maybe here, coming down to the legs, maybe down about here. So if anybody has problems of things like fitting things on a piece of paper, you notice like as you're drawing, all of a sudden it's like you're going off the page. Doing this kind of like landmarking tends to help you like place where things might go. Now this may not go to plan, you know, <laughs> it may not necessarily follow all these landmarks, but it still gives me some sort of trajectory to kind of go towards things. Um, so, a couple other qu comments and questions here. Um, Militant is asking, uh, are you planning to show us a knife collection in one of my streaming sessions in anytime soon? My knife collection, no. Uh, Mainly because I don't know how many people here would follow me for interest in knife collections. I guess maybe just for you. Uh, I do like to collect many, many things. Okay, Knives happen to be one of them. I like knife designs. I think I find them interesting. They're almost like even like pens. You know, uh, I like collecting pens. I have a bunch of them just right here, just sitting next to me on my table. Uh, I use most of these and, and I'm a collector of things. So in many sort of various items, uh, I, I like to peruse and understand brands and know about designs and materials and history and function and it makes me interested in all those things okay so let's start right off i wanted to start with the dragon but uh and this would be the typical kind of let's say the mentality of where we begin so jimmy is asking like you know what am i drawing today we're gonna draw some sort of dragon 
uh, Year of the Dragon festival kind of focus for the for the Chinese New Year. Um, initially, the, the head of the dragon was going to be right about there. Okay, so I can start drawing the dragon head. That's not too difficult. But I'm predicting towards the future right now. So when you guys sketch and draw, what what it's hard is to predict what's coming up because you're so focused on the immediate, right? I have to understand how to draw this dragon head. So you try to think about proportion, structure, anatomy, details, line, shadow, light, hatching, all that sort of stuff, right? If it's specifically line drawing. Um, so that's where your mind is now kind of channeling down into. However, I'm thinking further ahead because to me, I already know that the dragon head is not going to be that difficult to draw. Why? Just experience. Experience alone. So through your own experience, you'll be able to collect this sort of data. You're able to understand what you're able to process very well, and then hopefully predict what could be the potential problem. So what's a potential problem for me? It's not so much of a problem, but knowing the fact that it's going to be more of a challenging visualization, which is going to be the person, the character down here. Uh, one in terms of pose, angle, scale, um, you know, the character's look, even the interaction of the dragon to the person. So I actually want to remedy this first, right? I don't want to go into the thing I know what I'm going to do. I want to go into the thing that I know I'm going to have a bit more harder time doing. So if I can get that out of the way, then everything else starts to feel a bit easier through the rest of the process. So if you guys sketch things in the future, right now I know that I'm not drawing as much. Probably you're thinking like, draw already. <laughs> you know, but there's a lot of process of thought that has to go beforehand. So you, you want to think as much as you can prior before you place down marks. Some people will just start sketching. You know, random lines and spontaneous action and trying to s discovering things with, with movement, which can be kind of chaotic and, and sporadic at times. But and again, it's not like you can't get bad sketches from that. Uh, but I go with more intent, uh, not necessarily, again, like a locked in precision, more at least making choices as to where I could potentially go. Right. And then also setting myself up dealing with stuff uh, in the, the kind of stacked ways of stuff that's going to help me more, with more success. So I want to place in the character here. His arm's gonna come straight up, where it's gonna go into the dragon's head. Uh, his arms could be straight, but I want it to be a little bit bent like this. So I'm, I'm going through the motions right now. So you're seeing me on camera, and, and you might think, do you do this all the time? Like, sometimes I will. You know, I hold a pose, and I think about, oh, what if the arm is punching or something like that? I, I might put up my arm just to kind of see where the position is, right? So if you guys don't act certain things out like that also too, it doesn't, it's hard to visualize. Because my brain, I can't, you know, I don't have perfect memory. And I can't necessarily see things as clear as crystal in my brain. Uh, it's very foggy. It's always morphous. It's constantly fluctuating and changing in and out. Uh, so it's never static at times in my brain. It's always like shifting here and there. So when somebody asks me, like, do you see the direct image? And I don't because my brain is constantly fluctuating through multiple things. Concepts and ideas and memory and visuals and things at play. So it's always just like mixing and matching. Uh, which sounds chaotic and a bit difficult to <laughs> be processing in your own mind. But you get used to it. Right. So what I'm going to do is deal with the person, the person down here. Um, now I'm trying to think about scale. So I'm going to put the person right about there. I'm going to zoom in a little bit tighter so that we can see where we're going to begin. His arm's going to be here, here. So what I'm doing now is ghosting the motion. As I'm ghosting the motion, what I'm trying to do is position where things will be in pose. So I'm not drawing right now, but I'm basically going through these motions, trying to figure out where well, the arms are up like this, torso is going to be over here, legs going to be down that direction. Um, and the more and more I start to go through the motion of it, the brain becomes a bit more uh, confident. I solidify the sense of what's going to happen drawing-wise. Okay, So now I could just start with the head, but I'm not going to because with the way the pose is, the arm is going to overlap the upper torso area just a little bit like that. Just a little bit overlap. So I actually want to need to deal with the arm first. So people ask me, it's like, how do you go and draw straight into this? Well, again, what I'm talking to you guys right now, I don't necessarily talk about this when I'm doing it by myself, but it's all in my brain. And it happens in flashes of seconds, right? So, um, but now I'm, as I'm live with you guys, I'm speaking about it, telling you exactly what's going on mentally. Now I'm positioning where things are going to go. Uh, let's put now the, just the forearm here. As the forearm comes around, we're going to have him... Uh, with the clothing of the sleeves flowing in this direction. The hand's going to go up this way, but you're not really going to see the hands because they're going to be inside this like puppet head thing with the dragon. So I'll place in already some 
information regarding the uh, the puppet itself, this living puppet going this way. This is a relatively thin line. Um, I would prefer if I could be using a pen with a bit more of a variable line, but this will be good for now. I'll, I'll make do. So now as we go through, let's say we place the shoulder about there. And let's just finish up the details of the sleeve and the clothing. Now, is my brain already like thinking so much further ahead? To a degree, as I'm drawing this part, I'm already kind of thinking about where the head's going to be. So let's place in the head right about here. He'll be a bald kind of monk looking dude. We'll place in the face a little bit later on because I want to think about his expression a little bit later. So I leave that kind of open, just vacuous. A couple questions here. Ryan's asking, friend asked how to improve his art uh, the other day. So I lent him the copy of Denim the Bible. Awesome. Thank you for um, sharing that for me. And a couple other ones here from Jason is, are there any plans to distribute the blacksmith or possibly make it available to purchase online? Well, the blacksmith comic that I developed back in 2017 and then had out uh, through Kickstarter in 2019 uh, was sold primarily online at that time. Uh, I still have copies left over from my own personal distribution. I don't necessarily sell it online though because I may, mainly take them to conventions and shows, Jason. So unless you went to like a physical show to meet me and come to uh, you know the table, you could potentially get it at that point. But unfortunately, I don't necessarily have it online due to the fact that since it's only me, uh, spending time trying to do all the distribution and shipping and that sort of stuff is not the most ideal. So uh, at this point in time, it's not available. So the best thing you could do is maybe look for moments or opportunities in which I'm going to be in certain shows or venues. Uh, whether you can make it or not, maybe you have somebody in that location or going to the show that can pick it up for you. So that's a possibility. I've had people do that before. Uh, other than that, unfortunately, at this time being that book in particular, which I am planning to do more of, the blacksmith comic that I made several years ago, I have planned to continue. So hopefully I will be able to find maybe some other help uh, into the future to be able to get that book out. Um, and quickly, by the way, I didn't... I wanted to make sure I confirmed this, but hopefully the audio is okay. Last time I think people were saying that the audio was a little bit quiet. Uh, but I hope it's just a little bit of adjustment here that the audio is clear enough. S uh, apologies for my speaking speed. I tend to talk very fast, so <laughs> try to keep up best you can. Um, it's just how I normally talk. So uh, Another question here, Ajag is asking, you know when you're done with Bible book restocks? It's a good question. I have no idea. <laughs> if I knew, I would tell you. Uh, and because I don't necessarily run the printing process, I just made the book and, and gave it to Superani for them to publish it. It's, it's kind of up to them as to when that book will be back in stock again. It is currently out of stock everywhere uh, in the U.S. and also in Europe. Uh, they usually do a run of about 1,200 to 1,500 copies, uh, which isn't necessarily massive. But the, the, the number of copies they print, it's for global you know, distribution, for international selling and for U.S. domestic selling. So uh, they split those copies up. So they print it in, I think, in somewhere in Asia, I think Korea, uh, and then they ship it by boat to all these different places, like in the U.S. and whatnot. So it can take months sometimes, even just once the shipping starts to happen. But the printing process alone can can take a bit. Uh, I'm assuming they, they would have started it, um, but they don't inform me exactly all the stuff of that information. Um, like I said, if I had that information, I would tell you, but I don't. I hope that they will go back in stock soon. The second book is in process, and I'm hoping to get that out by the summer of this year, if timing allows, um, due to the fact that Superani is, uh, you know, they have their own timeline, a schedule as to when they want to release books. So we talked last December about possibly getting the second Dynamite Bible out, and they were okay with me doing it, um, but now I just have to get it out in time in terms of getting all the pages done, so... But the second book is coming, for sure. I wish it was immediate and guaranteed for a certain time, but at this point, you know, uh, running my own school and trying to do the books is just something I have to kind of do when available, <laughs> time-wise. So uh, Handsome Man is asking, do you think you'll finish your fantasy island, uh, fantasy island journal this year? And if so, where can international buyers buy a copy? So that is the intent. I have two books planned for this year, Matt. Uh, the first one, of course, is the Dynamic Bible 2, Volume 2. And then I plan to do the, the Fantasy Journal, 
which is in the process of being made, and I'm hoping to get that done at the end of this year. So that book, if uh, once ready to be printed, will be out by next year. Um, well, yeah, so that's the idea, two books. So one book for this year for release, but two books to be finished, finished, but printed probably next year, uh, early next year. And that's going to be through, um, I hope, through a Kickstarter, not through Superani. Uh, it'll be through a different publisher and actually based in Europe. This is a potential. This is me just talking about it. Nothing is fully confirmed just yet, but uh, the person I'm going to work with, he's been wanting to work with me for, for a while now, and he wants to produce a book. And we just had a meeting, actually, about a week and a half ago, uh, and asking, like, you know, when can we start making a book? <laughs> so I, I pitched him that one in particular, the journal, the fantasy journal, which has a bunch of creatures and whatnot. So he was excited about that one. He was very interested, and uh, we'll see if it goes ahead. I don't mind sharing it as information. I don't know how if he's even okay with it, honestly. But <laughs> uh, for myself, I like talking about future projects that are not necessarily even out yet, because uh, for me, it's a it's it's a way to be able to promote it. Honestly, um, that's why I, I even share pages of it. You know, it's like some people will take projects and they'll work on it for years and never share and reveal it until it's fully ready. You know, but for myself, I I need to share it while I'm working on it. So even like the Dynamic Bible too. Once I get more pages kind of confirmed and done. I will share a few of them on Instagram. I'll, I'll show you what they look like and what I'm working on. So um, anyways, so that's the intent, Matt. Um, the questions here, Karina is asking, what do you recommend we practice before a class of mine, specifically creature development? I would say a lot of it is going to be into certain artists in particular you like to follow when it comes to the world of creature development and design, uh, seeing how they process information, what kind of research do they do, if you can find that information at all. Uh, what are some of the mediums and properties in which they've applied that design towards? Uh, is it games and movies? And is it books or comics? Um, where is some of the application of interest for you? But looking at other artists and seeing how they've done it, it'll expose you to all those different channels. So research is a big part of it. So it's not just like drawing more, which, yeah, that can help as well too. But I think getting more context of understanding of where certain, let's say, processes of things like design, for instance, char uh, character or even creature development, uh, can go for, you know, towards a certain area of uh, focus. Uh, it's not to say you have to decide upon now as to what you want to do. I'm just saying understand, you know, where some of the areas of an application are going towards. Uh, so that's one thing I would say you should maybe think about a bit more, at least look at, you know. Beyond that, of course, yes, it is also, you know, having interest in just drawing daily, uh, a lot of animals and stuff like that as well, too. It can be fantastical based if you want it to be. But I think a lot of it is also just more of going to the visual um, library, building it up. Uh, and, and being able to get a lot more influence, influence and inspiration of wildlife in general. And so that way it might come into use, an application to one of our designs that we'll do in the class, uh, once that becomes a situation, okay? Uh, let's see. No Name Draft is asking, how did you learn to draw without reference? Um, well, I draw with reference all the time still. <laughs> but because of that, because I've been drawing with reference constantly, from photographs to real life and... The, the familiarity of that subject matter gained, but you're talking about 20 plus years in doing it, you know? I mean, you, you put 20 years into anything, I'm pretty sure you could be pretty confident, right? Uh, the degree of quality level or, or in terms of the level of skill from person to person may vary dramatically, some more, some less. And, and you know, there are people out there that are way better than me in terms of what I'm able to do, in terms of just simple drawing. Um, but in terms of my own capacity of what I'm able to pull off, a lot of it is just simple practice, you know? Uh, it's certainly not talent-based, but I think, of course, education helps dramatically because if it's formatted in a way where it's, let's say, uh, presented or packaged in a, a practicing method in which you would then obviously then put into your own practice yourself, uh, you can then build those sort of same sort of skill sets that uh, me and many of my contemporaries would be doing similar things. So right now we're at about the portion of the character here. So this is where the dragon's underside is going to be. This is like the jaw section. Uh, so as I go a little bit higher up, the rest of the head of the dragon will be up here, going down this direction, switch back that way, going over here. So this character, I'm going to keep finishing out. So let's do his upper torso finish. Um, and because we're kind of looking up at him, a lot of the turn from the belt will go this way. I'm always thinking about where I can you know, overlap something. This is where some of the sash, the material will flap and flurl all around, giving it a bit more of a dynamic movement. 
here I'm not trying to draw the material of his belt realistically. I'm thinking more about the shape design for the consideration of movement. As it's flapping through the air because of his movement of action. There's his other side of the belt turning around to his waist. That consideration, the fact that we are not trying to draw anything photoreal. We are, we are creating. We can take liberties on stuff. We can make decisions and choices on a creative level of aesthetic value to just our own sort of storytelling. And it doesn't have to follow the rules of reality at times. Uh, you can break things when it comes to things like perspective or anatomy or proportion or line or shape. Um, it doesn't have to conform to things like this. And this is why it can be fun because you're not bound by reality. So even though this is representing things that can be true to our world around us, I'm able to manipulate and play with this to a degree of level in ways that I want to, uh, which gives me then the confidence to uh, draw in the way I want to now uh, because I'm not bound by anything. So being able to let that part go, this bounding factor of reality, uh, because you are drawing creatively, will help a lot. But that takes practice a lot of times because the mind uh, wants to make sense of things. So you become so influenced by other things around you as well too, from the realities and the trainings and your cup is somewhat already filled by social media, uh, telling you all these things about what you should be doing. And um, your brain gets overly overwhelmed and anxious and concerned about the way it's supposed to be done. There is no actual way it's supposed to be done. You just do it because it's fun. No. A couple of questions here. Uh, let's see. Any plans to visit Europe this year from Josh Baker Draws? Is there actually a possibility? Well, first, there is. Um, it hasn't been announced just yet, but I don't mind talking about it. <laughs> and if they say, oh, you should have mentioned this thing, like, I don't care. Uh, I'm going to be going to Germany. In May, I will be there for an event called We Are Playgrounds. And it's a open to the public conference you can get a ticket for. Uh, there's be a bunch of artists coming together. And I'll be there as well too doing a talk and a workshop in Berlin in May. So go to their website, We Are Playgrounds. You should be able to find their website information there. Nothing's been announced just yet, but uh, yeah, keep an eye on that. Obviously when they, when they put it out, I'll post it up again on my social media. But uh, now that you guys are here live with me, I don't mind chatting it up and mentioning stuff like this. Uh, I will be potentially, well, I need to talk with the school still. I've been, I haven't gotten back to them in so long and I feel really bad about it. But um, there's a school in Paris that I've done classes with and workshops with. So they have invited me from a while back and I kept forgetting to respond. But I, I would like to go back and teach with them again. And this is a school in Paris that does a lot of traditional, fundamental, and even design-oriented sort of classes uh, in person. So I may want to try to be there in September, fall of this year. But there will be two opportunities for the moment. Uh, spring, Berlin, possibly Paris in fall. There's another event coming up, which is the THU event, the Trojan Horse, that's going to be in Portugal. The Superani team is going, but I don't know if I'll be invited. Uh, and this is due to the fact that uh, THU, I think, only likes to bring people that are more exclusive to them. So I'm not exclusive to them. I tend to do shows like this all around the world. Uh, last year, I was in Poland uh, for a show called Promised Land. And because of that, because I'm spread around doing multiple things, uh, I don't think THU will be interested in, in involving me. So uh, for those of you that are based around that area of Portugal, unfortunately, I don't know if I'm going to make that show. Um, domestically, I will be in San Diego in July. Uh, I will be here in May, uh, spring, a show called Master Palooza in Pasadena. Obviously, Lightbox at the end of the year, and that's in Pasadena as well, too. And there's a vague, vague possibility for a, um, a New York Comic Con. That's in October. But I don't know if that's going to happen because the Superani team is going to be at that Malta event in Portugal. And so that's like a back-to-back -back show. So I don't know if they're going to do both of them. So far, I think that's the extent. I need to plan out the rest of my trip for the year. Usually in January to February, I have to plan out my entire calendar of 2024. Um, just so that I don't get overlapping things and people ask later on. I have to turn down stuff. Personal trip would be Yellowstone coming up in May as well too. Uh, I'll go see some bears and other animals coming out into the springtime. Um, 
last year I was in Kenya. This year we're not going to be doing Africa. We'll see if I do any other wildlife um, trips internationally. All right, we got that upper portion of the waist. Let's go down this way. This is the part of his upper shirt, extended in length. I'm already placing in certain like little shadow blockings and whatnot. That'll help create separations. Uh, what's in front, what's in back. A little bit of clarity of shape design as well too. Let's see, uh, a couple of the questions here. What Sailor Ink is this? The Sailor Ink that I'm using, the bottle is right here. I don't know the English name for it, it's in Japanese. Uh, I just bought it at a, at a Japanese um, stationery store, Kinokunuya here in LA. Uh, any sort of you know stationery store that carries Japanese brand stuff, potentially will have it, but this is what the bottle looks like. So question from Kino is how is the Amalfi paper? How would you describe drawing experience? So this is the Amalfi paper right now. It's a little bit thicker. Uh, I would say it's about the same thickness as to, well, not as thick as the Cottonwood Arts brown tone that cover stock paper, which is about a hundred pound paper. This is probably close to about an 80 pound paper, I think. Um, so it's relatively thick. It's got a lot of fibers into it. I'm drawing on the one side, which has a little bit more texture. The other side has texture as well too, but it's just slightly more uniform and smooth. So the way it's pressed, uh, this is the side in which you want to draw. I want to draw on. The other side is smoother, but it's not the same surface type. Um, but it's nice. It's more like a rag, like a linen or a cotton almost in a way. Uh, it feels really good. It's got a bit of tooth to it, but the ink does not bleed. So usually when I'm inking, like back when I was in high school, when I was a teenager, what I hated the most was drawing on those comic book papers, the blue line ones, and I would use um, repeatographs to ink my pencils. So when I would ink, uh, I would place the ink on there, it would like bleed into the paper, like, like Kleenex or something like that, uh, and it would, it would spread like crazy. And I hated that feeling. So as a kid, I always tried to find paper, and I, I always didn't use Bristol when I was younger. So when I was in high school, Bristol was my paper that I turned all the time. It was smooth, it was, it was uh, kind of a thicker paper and it didn't bleed when I inked on it. Um, but over time, the, the rougher and the toothier papers, like watercolor is really where I tend to, tend to go to. Um, this one doesn't really bleed though, but it's still got that nice tooth and texture that I really enjoy when it comes to paper quality. I think for myself, I still would be somewhat bothered by that bleeding a little bit. Uh, it's just something that I've kind of like built as a, what do they call that? Um, I guess a certain uncomfortableness when I'm working with materials. It just doesn't feel nice. See the leg, we're gonna have come up and down this direction. Let's move into this drawing a little bit quicker. When I'm speaking, um, I'm focused on the answers of the question at times a little bit. And even though I'm still drawing, I tend to kind of just do a little bit of mark making here and there. Uh, but we got to move a bit more now. Let me zoom out slightly. As the leg goes down this direction, lower calves over here. And we'll keep going down this direction for the other leg. We'll point the toes like this. We have the piece of his shirt, the back piece, flowing that way. So now his position is pretty much where I needed to be. So if I zoom out even further to the paper, you'll see where I've, this was a landmark right there. There was a landmark somewhere up here. There's a landmark here and there's a landmark there. So these marks kind of triangulated the position of the character. So I didn't know exactly what his pose was going to be. I didn't know the details. I didn't know his posing necessarily in the very beginning. Um, but I knew the location of where I wanted to place him from the head to the end of the foot. So that means I had to fit everything proportionally within this, that, that sizing, this spacing that is. The hard part, once you get into this kind of planning stage, 
even though you can position landmarks to help position where it's going to go, I would say the hardest part in, in the, the drawing application is going to be in proportion and scale, the size of the drawing itself. You know the location, but just because you know the location doesn't mean you know the size of the person, of the character, right? So the head had to be a certain size or else the rest of the body would follow suit and become a really big drawing. So I had to make sure I could plan the scale of the head so that the rest of the body will fit within that position. So that's, what is that part? I would say that's just experience again, you know, the experience of having drawn the human body many times, knowing if I draw the scale at this sizing, I know that the rest of the form will follow to a certain proportion of scale that will fit in that position. So um, tough, that's tough to do because you got to be able to already preemptively understand and feel the sizing and scaling of things. So how do I, you know, practice that? Well, of course, you know, any sort of classes that go into figure drawing are really good, but it's not even so, so much on classes. It's about being able to allow yourself to experiment, right? To try and, and then even to fail. So in my classes and in many other art classes, of course, it's all about that, that, that process of trial and error and being able to build towards a familiarity so that as you potentially will work on future things that are similar in nature, uh, you'll be able to execute them with higher levels of, of quality or, or precision. Um, could have there been a chance when I drew this that I could have misscaled it? Absolutely. Just because I have you know 20 years of experience doesn't mean I can't make mistakes. And I, I definitely do. Um, but it's not to the extent anymore in which you know it's not unsolvable for me. Uh, because there can be mistakes all over, and I'm able to remedy them through different sort of actions, to disguise it, to integrate it, to whatever the case may be. Um, but in the beginning, because you're not really quite sure what you want to go for, what you have to do is make sure you plan and then just try. So this is why, of course, pencil drawing is perfectly fine. Uh, as you pencil it, oh, I'm wrong scale, you erase it and do it again. But it seems like a long process, right? Which is why the common question is, how do you draw without reference? How do you draw with straight pen? How do you draw without any sort of underlay? How do you draw without a reference? It's simply the trial and error. I used to pencil all the time. I used to ink those pencils all the time. I would draw from reference constantly. Um, and I still will draw from reference all the time. Do I draw with pencil anymore that much? Only if I want the intent of drawing with graphite, but not as an underlay anymore, you know? Um, anyways, just, just to inform you about, you know, the many of the mentalities of the, of the things that I go through and, and the commonalities of the questions that people tend to ask. So these sort of live stream, you know, I understand is sort of interaction, but always tends to go to this educational side of discussion and talk. So I, I hope that you guys are able to, you know, listen to this and understand it as more of an experience. Things that you can maybe pick up on things as being able to try to integrate for yourself to some degree. I'm not trying to tell people as to what they should do, but these are things that I do. And so because if you follow my work in any way and if you like it to some degree, hopefully that will give you some information that you can just try for yourself and see what happens in the outcome. Um, and at the end of the day, you should just draw like you, right? Let's see a couple of the questions and comments. Uh, sorry if I missed a couple here. Laria was asking, am I familiar with Bernie Wrightson's Frankenstein work? I am. Do you like that vintage old school work? I do. <laughs> Simple as that. Uh, I think it's, it's spectacular. I've seen some of his originals in person. It was at a show. I'm going to zoom in a bit more, by the way. Uh, a little bit closer like that. Let's go back into this. Uh, I went to a show called the, the um, what was it called? It's called Del Toro. The, it, it was Guillermo del Toro's exhibition. Um, basically, he took all of his collection of like his personal art collection stuff that he's bought over the years, or I guess had from his own personal projects and work, but from collecting other artists. Uh, but the Del Toro show had all the stuff that he had his own mansion for and put it into a show in LA. Um, I went to that show like four or five times just to go sketch and draw because <laughs> I love Guillermo del Toro's work, right? Um, but he had four rights and originals and several of them were of the Frankenstein pieces so I've seen some of those up close in person man I'm, I stared at those drawings for like 15 minutes straight just staring at them and then from there of course I would actually try to study them and maybe pull some things out of it my favorite piece that Brennan Wrightson has done there's two actually my favorites one in particular is the man inside the crate right the wooden box and he's sitting there with his cup he's covered up in a pose and you see light coming through in between the little slats of the wood and stunning. His con Why Bernie Wrightson is amazing for me is because of his control of light. Light and shadow and value. Simply by using line. Light is really difficult for me. Value. 
uh, when I when I went through school and college, you know, I saw things through shape and form, but I didn't really understand value and light very well. So that's why I wasn't a very good painter. Um, but it's not like I didn't understand it, you know, to be able to use competently. I, I was fine. It just I didn't excel within it as a lot of my other friends did who were more focused on how the world works with light and value. I saw things, again, through shape and form. Um, so anyways, to me, it's someone who is mostly a shape and line guy, uh, and as Bernie Wrightson is also a line person as a draftsman, his understanding of light with the use of line was such an interesting combination for me. Because, you know, most people who draw, to me, don't really bring in light in a way that he did. It was designed so... It had a lot of atmosphere, had a lot of depth, and it was organized in a manner where it felt so dense, but you knew exactly where to look. So his ability to control light and shadow with simple line was what was incredible. So if you don't know who Bernie Wrightson is, you guys should look at more of his stuff. Uh, but yes, that particular piece, but there's another one, which is the woman hanging from the tree who was hung there. That was one of the originals that Del, Tor Del Toro had. That one I also stared at for <laughs> so long. Um, incredible drawings. But then his whole collection of series is just insane. Never got to meet him, uh, which I had, but yeah. Bernie Wrightson is one of the individuals from a list of many inspirations that I have that I talk about in my classes uh, as to like why I follow them, how, what I look for, that sort of stuff, how I dissect them or break them down. Uh, that's an example of how I take someone like Bernie Wrightson and I isolate stuff in terms of how I integrate it with my own work. To the best of my ability, of course. Bernie Wrightson was self-taught. He learned perspective on his own. And his work is incredibly detailed, but it's, it's that fact of balance. Organization, his ability to organize details, which is so good. Hopefully that answers your question. <laughs> uh, let's see. Uh, sorry, I missed a couple questions at the top. Ah, okay, here we go. Question I get is, do you have any plans on visiting the Rose City Comic Con? Uh, not necessarily. I'm, I'm assuming when you're, you're talking about the one up in Northwest. Um, I'm from Portland. But I've never been to the Rose City Comic Con. Emerald City I've been wanting to go to in Seattle, but I've never been to that one either too. Uh, hopefully one day I can visit some of these other Comic Cons that I've never really been to. Uh, a couple years ago, the first time I went to the one in uh, Florida, in Miami, the SuperCon, which was pretty fun, actually. I uh, didn't essentially go back to the, the following year or this year, but it was nice to be in, in an area in a Comic Con that I've never been to. Mega Con in Florida would be something I'd, be, uh, I'd like to go to as well. Possibly some in Texas. I've been wanting to go to ones in... There's one in San, San Antonio, I think, maybe. Maybe in Dallas. We're just going to finish out some of the details on this posing over here, and then we're going to go to the dragon, okay? So I'm going to use hatching uh, and shape design for shadow play. Not realistically, but more for just the uh, aesthetic nature and the visual of being able to separate elements from the front to the back. A uh, question from AJ is, is there a certain amount that people can attend the classes? Uh, you pay for the sit and seat, so uh, will you be able to attend still? Yes, you can. If you pay for the seat, then you're in. But there is a limit. Uh, the limit is up to 20. And in terms of full seats of people that get feedback, the limit is 10. So the amount of people that will be in the class total will be 30, but 10 of them will be the ones getting full feedback. But if you pay for the sit and seat, if you already pay for it, then you're, you're fine. Um, let's see here. Do you think you would still be drawing to this day if there were no art jobs in the world? Maybe it's a stupid question. It's not a stupid question, actually. Uh, I would be. And I've, I've thought about this when I was younger all the time. And I would mention it as I was a young teacher in my 20s to 30s. Is that I tell students all the time is that this is something I would still be doing if I wasn't working. It is so ingrained into my very fiber of being that I, this is all I think about. <laughs> you know, I spent hours drawing yesterday but i don't do that all the all the time it just happened to be yesterday i did you know i went to the museum drew for like three or four hours just for myself it wasn't for work it wasn't for a job it wasn't even training you know it, it's just for me it's just fun so i went to the museum to go sketch for myself afterwards i went to go hang out uh, with my friend who's in town right now um, and he's at the the national geographic summit a big meeting with a bunch of filmmakers 
and um, I snuck in. I was kind of incognito, and I was and we were at the bar in L.A. It was a hotel bar, and there was a bunch of Nat Geo people, like you know, all up and comers and filmmakers. And I'm not a filmmaker, so they're asking me, it's like, well, who are you and what are you doing? It's like, oh, I just draw, <laughs> I design things, and they were fascinated in that kind of stuff. And I was at the bar just having a drink and drawing, drawing then still, you know, for a couple hours. And so today, you know, I, I got up and I had to actually go to a camera repair shop to drop off my camera body, uh, do a little bit re repair work. And I came back home and relaxed a bit and watched the film and ate and had lunch and then, you know, jumped on here. I draw with you guys for a couple hours. But I'm not doing this for work. I don't get paid for this, right? Uh, I understand it's a way to promote my other stuff, maybe classes and whatnot. You might think, oh, don't you get paid for like the advertising and stuff like that on YouTube? It's like, not very much. 20 bucks, <laughs> you know? Um, so thanks for lunch, basically. But so would I still be then drawing if I wasn't getting real work? Yeah, but here's the thing, is that I would always find a way to make this into a real work. I would be able to find a way to do it. Because this is something that uh, I'm able to do at a competent and confident level to a degree in which it maybe even um, produces at a level of competition or I guess comparison to others that can be elevated against others uh, in which I can, you know, produce things at a, at a, I don't know, a product or some kind of marketable thing that is something that people would want. Uh, and I know uh, uh, on what people would want from me. So even if I didn't actually have a full-time job, on my own, I would just make my own things. And here's the thing, I am doing that, right? I don't have a full-time job. I don't work for a company anymore. I did. I did for like seven to 10 years. But for the last you know, number of years, I've been on my own. So the school is, of course, my kind of full-time gig. And that's teaching. And yeah, that's still work. But I'm, it's fun for me. I'm just drawing and teaching people how to do stuff like I'm doing with you guys right now on YouTube. Um, but even besides that, I'll do like freelance works yeah, here and there. But it's all independent. And of course, I make my own stuff. I'll make my own book. You might think, well, you have publishers and all kind of stuff. But for over you know, 10 years, I published my own stuff. The, the Dynamic Bible was the very first book I published with another company. Every single book I ever made was my own. You know? uh, anything I ever made money on was on, on my own product. And I, I would go out there and public, you know, produce it and sell it, go to a show and put it out there. Sometimes it sells and sometimes it doesn't. And it's scary because there's no guarantee it's going to work. Um, but experience, because I've been doing this now long enough, 20 plus years, that I've been able to see all the ups and the downs. And I now understand what can work, how much time it takes, how much it costs, and what it needs to be done. Uh, I have that information of experience. But in the beginning, of course, it was hard as hell. Especially when I left the industry. I didn't know if I was going to be able to make it. So today in this world, where it's really rough right now, the industry is kind of going down and, you know, things like games had a huge layoffs recently. Animation not doing so well either too. Film is in a completely different sort of world now in terms of like what artists do. It's not no longer like two-dimensional anymore. It's mostly 3D work. Uh, so for us who are artists and they come into a class like mine, they will ask like, well, why am I even taking your drawing class? You know, how am I going to get a job? Well, the question is, are you doing this because your outcome is only just for a job, right? Or are you doing this because you're trying to you build a skill in which you love so much? in which the byproduct could be a job, or you would make it some kind of work, or you would be able to make some kind of product that you can sell for yourself, right? Yeah, the, the option of going to a company is still there, but if that's not happening, is that still gonna stop you from wanting to create, to express, to storytell, to make something? Certainly it hasn't for me, just because the industry is in some sort of status, right? So the market should not dictate as to when I should create or not create, as to when I wanna make something or not make something. Do I want to sell something or not sell something, right? That doesn't dictate it. I do. So if I make good quality stuff, somebody will be interested, all right, at some point. And then all it takes is the patience, the time, and the confidence to do so. Then the consistency, year after year, then from decade to decade, right? But none of this stuff is easy, but it's not supposed to be. Because as they will always say, right, then everybody would do it. Kind of feels like that though now, right? Like everybody wants to do that. I don't know if that answers your question, but I hope it helps a little bit. I don't know if it helps at all even too. Maybe it makes you feel bad. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, so apologies. Um, 
Am I a fan of Claire Wendling? Absolutely. Claire is an amazing person. I had lunch with her many years ago when she came to Pasadena for one of the first life boxes, like in 2019. We just hung out, uh, took her out to lunch and took her a tour onto Art Center, the college, when I was teaching out there. And um, we just got to know each other, her and her husband. Uh, I haven't seen them since COVID because she she has a lot of, you know, health things that she's going through and she seems to be doing well. Uh, I saw pictures of her being recently at the um, certain Comic-Con event in, in Europe. I think that was Angolan. She was there. So she seemed okay, but I know that she's not necessarily trying to put herself in the public limelight right now, but um, I hope for the best for her. Let's see, a couple of the questions. So I'm trying to skim through the chat a little bit right now. Kubi is asking, as a starting college student, would anyone recommend I get into this industry? Uh, if so, where would most in most income come from as an artist? So, you know, everything I just mentioned right now, hopefully touched upon that subject to, to a degree. If there's something else you want to uh, ask within that, Kubi, you're more than welcome to. But hopefully the, the things I mentioned today uh, helped at least touch upon that subject to a degree. Follow-up question from Alaria. Do you think there would ever be a comeback for those old-school styles like Franklin Booth, Joseph Clement Cole, and yeah, all those guys I know very well. It's a shame that we don't see that, that kind of styling anymore. Well, I think like anything else, trend, right, is a big factor. And the trend is, is based on, of course, the, the numbers of people that consume that sort of product. Um, and what's consumed and seen most of today, what you know, we grew up as things like in cartoons and comics, a lot of anime is still really popular right now, mangas as well too. So that's usually the main sphere of influence as to many of the art styles going into the future. So as those young people are growing up, that's where their application goes. And there's different sort of, you know, changing of guards and revolutions in, in terms of art and ideas and concepts of what's popular and trending and, um, you know, what's even valid valuable I guess is the other uh, kind of word I could use it was what 10 15 years ago would we have said people who drew in the anime styling were seen as valuable most art instructors who are traditionally trained would say no right they wouldn't look at anime as like true art forms they would say that's kid stuff get out of here right but today it's not the same way because people who have grown up after the past 15 20 years who were young let's say students who now became professional artists and being teachers so I grew up with animes and mangas and comics when I was, you know, a kid from the 90s and the 80s. So I love that stuff still. And as a teacher who's been traditionally trained, but still love the modern things, I like drawing in the, the comic styling and manga and anime styling. And I don't think that's necessarily a low tier style of work, right? I think it can be equally as fascinating and requires the same levels of skills in some cases. Uh, but I understand. You know, people will still see the old stuff as a tried and true method, but it's all based on movements you know, at the time period of when things are coming out. So I don't necessarily devalue or upvalue things in any way. It's all different types of things in different generations, which I equally value all of them, you know. Um, so I definitely love the, the classical things from Booth to Cole to, um, who's that, um, just someone had, who's, God damn it. <laughs> uh, who was that? Charles Dana Gibson. You know, Gibson's work or uh, even the ones we just mentioned, right? Um, the guys like Mobius or whatever the case is. You know, all those people. My favorite's Cly, Heinrich Cly, uh, or Topi, you know, Sergio Topi. So, you know, there's still a market for that, but it's not the most popular these days anymore. Um, but that's the way it always goes, you know? And, and is there ever going to be a resurgence for it? No, I don't think so. Because I think it never really went away. It's just that, you know, the, the numbers of individuals having that same level of passion for them, it's not necessarily shrunken. It's just that, um, you know, there's just that much more stuff. It's, you know, that's all it is, really, I think. But I can understand for, for the younger generations coming up, even going through traditional education, they may not necessarily get exposed to all the individuals. Some of them I found later in life, you know. So I think as you just naturally mature, uh, which you can have an interest in a specific thing, let's say like anime or manga, I think at some point down the line, if you're at least open, you know, receptive to art history and different forms of, you know, application of that, whether
whether for illustration or fine art or uh, graphic storytelling, animation, and movies, that you will eventually cross paths with these uh, traditional people or classical people. Uh, Milton had a question, which is, uh, did I like Del Toro's personal sketches? Absolutely. I think he can draw very well. <laughs> uh, I would, he's one person I would love to work with. Guillermo del Toro. You know, any project that he'd be on, oh man, to be able to help design will be so much fun. Probably very intensive, but. Because the problem when you're working with somebody who also is very good, you know, they have an eye for it. Uh, so they're going to know how to, um, you know, discuss things and ask for stuff. And they're probably going to challenge and push you quite a bit, which is, you know, like I said, a good thing as well, too, but hard. Uh, because they can really take you to that level. Someone else like that I hear is uh, like Cameron, James Cameron. He's also a quite a strong draftsman himself. Okay, this character is relatively done. Uh, oops, sorry, turn the camera off. Let's go up to the dragon. We'll touch on him a little bit later on up here in details. Let's go up here. This is the underside of his jaw. Uh, so let's place in, how about we do a tongue first here. Just because. Put his bottom lip there. And then we'll put his upper structure, his jaw up here. Some teeth. We'll clarify that stuff out later on. <clears throat> Just have that long whisker go this direction. You know how like in cats and dogs they'll have that side lip and they have a little bit of that skin tag almost coming out of it? That's where all this stuff comes from. Real animals. Maybe I'll intermix it with like fish, like gills. And a combination of birds maybe too. It'll be a living type of dragon, but this thing is being manipulated by people. Let's see if there's any other comments and questions. Uh, to some more stuff that I missed. Um, so I need to skip through a little bit here. Uh, da, da, da. Nick asks, when you're out with friends and family, do you draw? Yeah. <laughs> uh, you want to, but you worry it might be rude. No, I do it all the time. All the time. Now, of course, you know, there are times and places in which I'm going to be considered to. Like, for instance, I wouldn't show up to, like, a wedding, you know, bring my sketchbook and draw at their wedding and stuff like that, right? Unless I'm drawing them and they ask me to. Um, but in those kind of typical situations, of course, common sense, yeah. But, you know, in, in general casual settings, I, I have no problem with that. And people who, who grew up, you know, with me, friends and family, would already understand and know that's what I do, right? Uh, so I guess maybe they would tolerate it to a degree. But more if anything, they, they get accustomed. I guess is the best way to put it. But it's not also the fact that I'm kind of doing that and sitting on by myself, not interacting. I mean, of course, I'm going to be socializing and conversing and talking while I'm drawing and that kind of stuff. And other times, I think it's also, again, location. If I'm at like a bar or a cafe or something like this, it's great. If we're at a dinner, you know, with a bunch of people, yeah, probably not. It's all choosing your place when you want to draw and sketch. Michael's asking, do you recommend any of the Prismacolor shading or colored pencils for beginners or novices? Yeah, any sort of materials, pens, pencils, colored pencils, pastels, anything you can get your hands on, you know, just to play with. It's not about producing anything beautiful or professional right now. It's getting a sense of what sort of materials and tools are best for your expression. And the only way to get good at those sort of materials is to just try them, play with them, 
And maybe you feel like, well, I don't know if I'm going to produce anything good. Well, you're not supposed to, you know, you're just supposed to be able to feel it. What seems to click for you, right? What intrigues you? That sense of curiosity has to be built. And to play with the materials is the only way to, to get a sense of it. There's his mouth. I have a bunch of uh, layers of scales. His cheek will be here. The horn will go out that direction. Some parts I like to draw and just kind of, again, establish just to get a sense of where it is. Move into another part. I just interconnect all those things later on. And his body's gonna go out this way, it's gonna turn. That was a landmark right there, and I just kind of integrated it into the drawing. This is his horn. This is a Chinese New Year thing for those of you who are joining up for the first time. Um, live drawings like this, the theme is usually established as an idea in the beginning. I don't come in here knowing what I'm exactly going to draw, but the idea was something related to the Chinese New Year, Year of the Dragon. Um, so that I had at least a thought about uh, as, as what I wanted to maybe draw. But in terms of the image in mind, I didn't really necessarily have a plan. Um, so far, it's okay. So I'm going to have him continue on this direction. I'm going to put another person right here. Going up this way. Body will turn this direction. Wrap around. Back over this way. Put another person there. So what I want to do is a large, medium, small character in a person. I may put something in the foreground here. Going this way with us. To have something overlapping. Just to kind of fill up that space right there. Maybe. I don't know. We'll see. Hey, uh, Mike, welcome back to the live stream. Glad you were able to join in. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm hoping that you'll be able to join us in the future as well, too. Look forward to it. Big Beans is saying, I've recently found the opportunity to get a mentor, finally, and was just wondering if you had any tips on approaching this process. Is it informal and natural to say, will you be my mentor? Uh, I don't think it's the most ideal kind of suggestion or the best way to approach it. Uh, approaching some sort of professional directly by saying, will you be my mentor? Because for myself, I get turned off of that quite quickly. Um, I don't think it's how a true mentorship is established. And I don't think that's the, the working uh, approach towards an actual program like that. But this is just my opinion, okay? So anything I'm saying here, please don't take it as a means of like what you should be doing or how you should be doing it. Uh, this is all dictated by my own experiences, what I've gone through, how I do things myself, um, and just how I feel about them, basically, you know. But in terms of mentors, I'm glad you have somebody. Uh, and I think in terms of just, you know, any tips of approach in the process, obviously that's what the mentor is for, right? Is there to kind of guide you and direct you and to support and encourage and, uh, you know, reinforce and challenge the things that you're trying to go for. And hopefully that person will be able to do that for you in a in a in a way uh, that's healthy, but also um, again kind of straining your abilities and skills uh, to be able to take you to those levels that you're looking for, and not necessarily to the exact points towards the ending goals, but at least in the same direction momentum they have to go towards. So he's kind of sending you off into the sunset, right? Uh, <clears throat> he or she or whoever that person is. So anyways, I think that would be the best recommendation. But for myself, uh, I don't take that wording of mentorship. Sorry, there's a piece of fur in my hair. Uh, I don't take that word of mentorship very lightly. Okay. Uh, so if anybody in people have in the past came up to me asking, hey, could you be my mentor? I'll pay you whatever you want. I, I don't want your money. That's not how this works. You know, I do offer my program out there, but I don't just take anybody. I have to talk to you first. And you have to go through an interview process. So when I do my mentorships one-on-one -on -one through my own 
online school, uh, if anybody asks, like, hey, I'm looking for a mentor. And so, okay, well, if you're interested in working with me, uh, before I do, do any sort of approval, I need to talk to you, right? I need to find out, well, who are you? Do we even actually have a dialogue going? Can we even talk to each other, right? Um, can I understand where your position is, what you're looking for? Do I fit within that equation? Can I actually even help you? Am I even interested, right? Working on the things that you want to work on. And then being able to build something from that. Not in terms of just your educational level, but also in what I will be able to gain from as well, too. Because this has to be a two-way road in a lot of ways. Um, and so some I will approve, some I will not. And so when that happens, and you say, well, here's someone else you can look at. You know, here's someone else you can maybe work with. But you know, in terms of when a mentorship really applies best is for myself, I like working with people that are looking to establish something of a project, something to polish, get into the portfolio. Because uh, I think that's where mentorship really fits best. As a professional, I'm trying to take your work to that stage of being from just a student to applying it to a portfolio that works towards professional level things, right? That's what I like doing. That's where it best fits in my opinion. Uh, fundamental work, you know, anything like practicing how to draw or whatever the case is, take classes, be with other people. But um, the mentorship wording, I don't take lightly, mainly because of my own experiences. You know, my teachers, my mentors, I call, weren't just teachers. They were people, they were humans I became very close with, family even. And you can't force that. You can't ask for that. I never asked any of my instructors to be a mentor. It's like, hey, would you give me two hours a week, you know, training me on something? The, the training part wasn't even so much technical. The, the, the technical parts of drawing, I learned in a class well enough. But my mentor, the reason I became very close with him is because just who he was as a person. I got to know his family, his wife, his kids, his whole extended family. After his passing, I'm still close with him. You know, I still see them. So it was no longer this idea of some student-teacher relationship. You know, he was the person that I just became friends with. I'm not saying that you have to find that sort of thing in a mentorship as well, too. But that was what happened for me in multiple cases. I had a mentor in high school. She wasn't even an artist. She was a language teacher, Mrs. Irwin. And I saw her last December for Christmas. Um, you know, she's in her, what, 70s now, probably? <laughs> uh, and I've known her since I was 15. And she was like a second mother. But I learned a lot about life through her, being just a person. So mentors are, are people of guides, right? Uh, people that can be there and being able to set you on a path of direction, not success within a specific thing of some kind of career, but in terms of, I think, just the, the mental and emotional support to some degree. Um, and thankfully, I had that in those cases. But like I said, it's not something you can find easily. It's not something you can just ask for. So that's why for me, when somebody says, like, you know, we, when simply simply says, you know, finding a mentor is, you know, something I need to have. Good luck. You know, it, it doesn't happen for everyone. Um, and if you do, you have to cherish it, which I did. And I, ne I know how fortunate I am because of that. Uh, it, it didn't come easily, but I had many opportunities of that happening. I was lucky in that case. And I know many people who are not. Uh, and it sucks because, you know, I hear about their stories about how they grew up and what they needed to have. And, you know, maybe a mentorship would have helped them or having someone that really guide them like that. And maybe it could have. But that's life, you know. You don't get everything you want. Anyways, um, regardless of that, I think hopefully your experience will have a lot of positive outcomes for you. Uh, and I think, you know, regardless of wherever you are, uh, at least having someone there to be able to at least just kind of go back and forth on, to be able to share, you know, your experiences, your ideas, and all that kind of stuff uh, will help no matter what. Well, if you're looking at Rich Kirby's, to, to follow up with the, co the conversation about mentorships, uh, my mentor, if you want to know more about him, was Norm, Norm Sherman. And he was a teacher at, at my college and art center uh, here in Pasadena. Um, and if you want to know about his story and, and what happened, you can, you can read about it. Just Google his name. You'll find the website for him. All right, let's put another person down here. Once I put the character there, then I'll go back and start hitting more details on the dragon. Um, let's, this time we'll put his head in first. Here, let's zoom in a little bit.
And um, A. Beckles, thank you for the donation, by the way. Appreciate uh, the support for the channel. And for those of you who are not subscribed to my channel, please do so. Because um, even though the, the live streams can be a little bit sporadic and pop up, I will certainly keep doing them for a long period of time. So uh, subscribe and you can watch more of the recordings in the future or hopefully join on some of the live ones when you catch them. And of course, I think the best thing you guys can do for me is to share it. You know, if you guys have social media accounts and Instagrams or whatever the case is, please help me um, share a story and talk about, you know, what you're watching and where you get your um, maybe uh, art advice and stuff like that for if you like it. Uh, share it for me, please. <clears throat> Question I'm getting right now is also is, sorry, and if I skipped a bunch of things, I apologize. Um, is art school worth going to? Yes, absolutely. Simple as that one for that one, too. Um, I mean, there could be a lot of underlying aspects to that question, which could be very loaded. Uh, but simply, yes, it is, in my opinion. Where am I currently finding inspiration for my work? I mean, everywhere. Again, yesterday, I was at the museum, the Natural History Museum in LA. And I went and drew a bunch of taxidermy birds, uh, looked at a lot of dinosaur bones. So I drew birds yesterday. So for me, it's a lot of times physical locations, places I can go to. Uh, I would usually want to do that instead of like looking online. However, of course, you can't always just, you know, travel to places that you want to immediately. So of course, going online is, is not a bad thing. It's just that for myself, I would prefer to be able to see the, the real stuff. Let's put this guy over here and we'll have him jump. And strike a pose. You know, the splits in the air. Uh, Big Beans is asking, in the past when you've spoken on how drawing has this amazing escapist type feeling, how you get lost in your imagination, this has inspired you heavily. What insight can you give reaching this space? For me, a lot of times it's um, allowing yourself to be able to expand on just only the visual. Meaning, uh, I literally had to stop before we did the stream. Um, and it happened to be about the sketch we did last time in the live stream. Right? And it was a, the little raccoon drawing. I don't know why I was thinking about this, but I just did. But it was a little raccoon, you know, walking away from his hut. And I remember in the live stream, I asked like, hey, what do you want me to draw? And somebody typed in raccoon and somebody typed in onions. Okay. So in the live stream, I mentioned that, oh, he's a, a farmer. He's going to plant and farm his onions. Did I draw an onion in the drawing? I did not. Right? However, just because I didn't draw it, doesn't mean that I didn't establish it in his world. So now that I've established that in his world, there's many more visuals that expand off of that one single drawing I had done last time of the raccoon walking away from his, house, his hut. Uh, because I can now start visualizing, oh, maybe he actually is now digging up onions. and Maybe the onions are like creatures or something like this, or they have some sort of uh, property or, I don't know, something in that world. But there's extra life, legs, beyond just that one image because of that one comment or the idea that I had establishes a deeper and also more developed world. So to get into that mentality and reaching that space of letting your mind escape into things, not isolating to a single image, right? What expands beyond this? 
as story going forward or what happened to build it up to that point from before and the elements in between all those things that help you imagine the other ways in which it starts to integrate in itself within it. And I think in that way, your brain is now constantly active on being able to imagine, man, what would I do with that idea? Where would this person go from there? You know, where did this character even come from? Why are they, you know, how are they actually manipulating this dragon? Uh, what is the connection between these two things? So I start to ask a lot of questions. And the more questions I ask, the more my brain starts to go deeper and deeper into these areas of, I wouldn't say escapism, but more of play. I'm playing like toys, as I mentioned last time, you know? So it becomes a, uh, a very entertaining, of course, which is why we do it in the first place, experience. Um, but for myself, it also becomes highly rewarding because it's applied to my everyday work as well, too. I hope that makes sense. But I literally was thinking about that before the live stream because uh, I saw the, the, the video that was already posted on YouTube. It's like, oh, that was that drawing that I had done. And was, I was just looking at it. And I remember that, that the onion was one of the comments that people wanted me to draw. I was like, I didn't draw an onion of that. I don't know why my brain was, was thinking about this. Onions <laughs> in the last drawing. But my brain tends to do this sometimes. It gets somewhat locked in on certain questions or, or ideas or even things that had happened that I, I had paid no thought to at all since that time until this very moment. Let's go down a little bit. Stanley's asking, have you done thumbnails before drawing this? No. However, have I drawn something like this? Yes, I have. It, was it a thumbnail? No. It was another piece much like this one that I just wanted to play with. And today, because my idea and theme was also, you know, dragons and Year of the Dragon for the Chinese New Year, I ended up drawing something with this similar kind of, uh, I guess, thematic nature. But it wasn't the exact same drawing. So, of course, I don't need to thumbnail it. And even if it was something unrelated to that sketch, normally I don't really thumbnail for my own personal drawings. However, I will thumbnail a lot. If I need to, for instance, if it's some sort of client work, um, I'll tell you guys about it now, but I'm not going to, I haven't posted it. It hasn't really been fully announced, but well, I can't tell you specifically, but I did a comic cover um, about a month ago. And the comic cover will be out hopefully sometime this coming spring. Um, and the comic cover was, was for a well-known character. And um, I was talking with, you know, the producer and, and the, the publishers and seeing what they wanted and whatnot. And so I, they wanted th thumbnails. So of course I'm going to do them, you know, and they would approve on whichever composition or, or the pose of the characters and stuff like that they would want. And I gave them a selection of them. And so once we go through that process and be able to isolate which one we're going to go forward on, then I'll execute the piece I need to, right? So thumbnails are, are very much a viable, necessary process within the professional jobs. But in my day-to-day -day work, I don't need to because this is drawing for me. <clears throat> Sean saying, uh, thanks for your advice around travel inspiration. Back in November, you spent about a month in Yucatan. That's awesome, man. Uh, and it gave me a new way to look at things when traveling for inspiration. I can only imagine. I was actually talking about the Yucatan yesterday. <laughs> uh, my friend is in town, uh, Manny Carrasco. He's based up in Salt Lake, Utah. Uh, he's here for that Nat Geo uh, summit at the moment. It's going on right now. He's over there currently. Uh, a bunch of filmmakers and, and we were watching a documentary last night on Disney Plus. And it's this, this dude that travels the world, this Asian guy named Albert Lin. Uh, I never heard of it before. Some of you guys may have seen these documentaries on Disney. Uh, Albert Lin. And he travels and he does this like LIDAR, LIDAR radar thing that scans like terrain and landscapes and discovers like new worlds and, or like new cities. It was fascinating. And he did one on the Maya, the Mayan people. And I was talking about, you know, his travels and whatnot. I asked him, have you been to, you know, any of these places? And he has. He mostly looked at a lot of Aztec stuff. And I've always wanted to go to Yucatan when I was young. So you mentioned that's like, yeah, it's, I can only imagine it must be amazing. Uh, do fountain pens usually get, usually rust out? No, not in my experience. Depending on the metal though. Some of the more um, antique ones can rust out. Because sometimes the internal mechanisms can also have a lot of metal pieces, but these are usually all plastic and fake metal. 
Um, so there's no rusting there. But the more vintage ones, uh, they have certain metals that could rust. But a lot of times these nibs are going to be either like gold plated, they're you know stainless steel, um, so they're not going to rust as much. And Kino, thank you for the donation, man. Appreciate that. Uh, I appreciate your comments. Glad you be, you're being a part of this. Let's see here. So we'll have the dragon come across here. We'll have the body. Oops, let me zoom out a little bit. So you can see where it's at right now. Let's have the body travel through this direction. Mostly a serpent-like dragon for now. I think what I'm going to do is place an arms down here. Limb structures for the dragon. I thought it would be nice to put them up here as well too. But I don't mind them being down here. So we'll put one of the hands over here with the claws. We'll come back and finish that later. So the rest of the body go through this direction. Hmm. I want to play with this a little bit more abstractly as well, meaning that the uh, drawing doesn't have to be so physically solid or tangible in reality, as we mentioned the idea of fantasy and playing with creative uh, imagination here so that means I can do whatever I want with this I can like make him disappear and come back or broken up with the body parts because just aesthetically I think it could be fun so what if I had the body literally break apart here it comes back almost as if he's like even not even a real physical thing but it's some kind of elemental it's almost as if they're like pushing against a cloud it's an interesting concept. It's actually more of a gaseous form. And these characters are able to push against this billowy kind of thing now. So I'll call it this way, down here. Same thing, I'm going to put a limb structure down over in this end, back legs. Give it more like talon feet from an eagle. I have another person maybe up here, kind of like riding the back end tail. Kind of fun. And like I said, I'll come back and finish up some of these areas of details to a certain degree of level. Uh, most of my attention and information is going to go right up here. Let's zoom back in a bit more. Let's go back up to the tail in this area and section. And um, let's do something else where we have a person in the back end. And maybe he's like gripping onto this tail section. Smaller in scale, so the level of information of detail will be more minor, uh, almost to a degree of a silhouette. Certain amounts of information, but I don't have to worry about making sure it's all like exact or fine. Even things like the hands could be just a shape. Even the face could be somewhat minimal to absent. We can indicate. Put his leg down over here.
silhouette. There we go. So there's all the elements I need now. Dragon's head coming down this direction. There was a landmark here. There was a landmark over here, here, and down here. Went past this direction. I hit that junction. Turned this corner around. Uh, got a nice, I'm glad I did the split pose. This really helped out well in terms of being able to push that direction of angle. Um, the one thing I don't like about this is just the parallel of that. I kind of want to break this up a little bit. The parallel in this, the equalness of space is not as visually interesting to me. So I think what we'll do is throw in some additional visual effects and that will help break up that space a little bit. So being a bit self-critical about the work, things I want to adjust. There's no fixing, it's just adjusting. Let's get back to some of the questions here. I had to ask how you would advise getting out of having to construct everything so much before the final line drawing. Notice it makes the final drawing a little too stiff. I think studying a lot of artists who will actually achieve a certain level of movement or expression and action a visual styling that you kind of favor in, in what you're talking about for me a, a break not a really a breakthrough moment but more of a moment of i guess inspiration was by looking at another artist and who i mentioned earlier happened to be heinrich Kley, and i found them when i was what my mid-20s uh, this is at a time when i was in the art center um and i found his illustration work just by chance and most of my stuff at the time when I was a student, I still felt very much like, oh, you did. And I felt like it was very stiff. Um, I overconstructed as well, too. Did a lot of underlay. And, you know, I think that can be one of the hindering factors of overconstructing, for sure. Um, and being able to use construction to an advantage, of course, but not letting it be the, the over-commanding faction or factor about your overall sketch. Um, it's got to be balanced properly, right? So you, you don't want to completely disregard or, or disclude construction, you want to be able to integrate it, but to a certain level in which you're also able to adapt and move and feel through the piece. Uh, and that's something I had to learn to do over time. Um, and looking at someone like Heinrich Klei, I was able to study his work, look at it, try to achieve some similar kind of movements, draw a similar kind of subject matter that he was drawing, and just pull from the visual, just feeling of it, you know? And being able to dissect the work down as to like trying to understand what he even was doing. Uh, because of course he wasn't alive anymore. <laughs> it's not like you just talk to somebody that understands everything that exactly he thought about. You have to just assume. But through practice, I've been able to break it down to a, a level in which it made me understand more about what I wanted to do with it. You know, um, so I think pulling from other inspiration is a huge factor. Can you find that through your own just practice day to day? I mean, probably, but actually, it would be probably slower. You know, so if you went through other individuals, that's probably gonna be your best bet. So the question also here is, how do you decide on the focal point? And not over detail when designing a character since I tend to over detail a lot. Well, in this situation and case, the simple factor is that this right here is the closest to you, the viewer. This is now going further and further away. So my attention to detail will go here as to where your eye needs to go first. This is where I want you to look. And from this direction, I'm going to have you go this way and this way and this way. But the level of information doesn't have to be equal because if it did, where would you look first? Right? So I'm going to use things like detail, contrast, line weight, um, maybe even the level of detail right in that one spot. And I'll concentrate that. But it's easy also to over detail because you forget. So how to remember more? Well, I think a lot of it is training. You know, through training, it becomes more muscle memory. It becomes more of a nature of, your, of, of the thought process that you have um, where at first you're not really thinking about it. You just tend to work, 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 work. And all of a sudden, hours will go by, you render the crap out of the entire thing. So you got to be a bit more attentive and aware, uh, which is why, of course, practice is just the part of this, the big part. And if you don't get it the way you want to, don't kick yourself. This is part of the learning practice. So looking back on the drawing, being like, oh, I, I don't like this because I, I overworked it. 
No, it's just a reminder. It's like, well, now I want to adjust this and this and this. So those experiences are learning experiences. And those drawings have to be done that way. The bad drawings are necessary. Don't discard them. Don't look at them negatively. It's a building process to get to something eventually where you want to get to. When that will happen, who knows? There's no guarantee of it. But what that should hopefully do is actually drive you. Because now you know what you want to do next, right? So criticism, feedback, dissection, or breaking down your work is not to isolate the mistakes and make you feel bad. It's to help you understand what to do next. And it should get you excited. It's like, now I know. Okay, less detail here, more detail this part. You know, I better remind myself about doing this. So in education, don't feel bad when somebody tells you, hey, by the way, this is not working, that's not working. It's not a, it's not a, you know, a personal thing trying to attack you know your inabilities or skill sets and experiences you understand that education is there to help you right so the change of the mindset is supposed to then again give you excitement about your next stages and beyond will i ever draw adventure time themed illustrations i have not never drawn anything from adventure time uh unless it was a commission you know from somebody like a comic-con saying hey would you draw this for me uh maybe but personally I don't know if I ever would. I think it's a pretty cool show. I haven't really watched it entirely, though. Um, the one show that I do quite like was uh, Gravity Falls. That one was a good one. Just kind of hitting a few details here and there. What I'm going to do now is uh, I want to just go back to his face real quickly. Add a couple of small details. Punch up that lime weight a little bit. And then we're gonna go into the dragon's head now. So let's zoom in right on that spot. Right in here. <clears throat> uh, sorry, I'm just kind of going through any other comments. Yeah, Sean, for the lighter stuff, uh, it, it was very fascinating. Will is asking, are you a fan or a Final Fantasy fan? Yes, I am. And if so, what do you think of Final Fantasy 16? I have it and I played it, but I haven't finished it. So it hasn't really gripped me as, uh, as well as some of the other ones. I'm excited about, about 7, the remake. The first one I thought was pretty good because obviously I've played the original 7 to death. Um, and that really was my first entry into Final Fantasy in the, in the uh, 90s and such. You know, the earlier you know, Super Nintendo, the Famicom versions were okay. I played them a little bit here and there, but... That until 7 on the PlayStation, of course, for like most people in that time. You know, that was a generational thing, I would say. Um, I think it changed the, the landscape of gaming in a lot of ways as well, too. And Final Fantasy was huge. So, of course, no, that, I think, was a big jumping off point for me. Nomura's designs and all that kind of stuff were always really kind of iconic. So, yeah, it was fun. But 16, uh, I, I like to trying to go more the the kind of classical fantasy look of things but i don't know there's something about the gameplay itself that i thought was a little bit hollow to me what i'm excited about is dragon's dogma 2 that one i am interested in playing next i haven't played the first one actually i knew about it never played it though but the second one i'm keeping an eye on And I'm happy that's actually coming out soon. And it's been in development for a while, from what it appears. Ajax is asking, when you started drawing, did you ever procrastinate or felt unmotivated? Uh, doesn't all artists, to some degree, I would say. Uh, maybe some would agree, some would not. For myself, personally, yes. 100% I have procrastinated and still do. <laughs> um, maybe some people are like, oh, I don't know, really? You seem like you're drawing all the time. But here's the thing. Um, when you're drawing for yourself, do you ever feel that you're ever really procrastinating? You know? Once it turns into like a project, like an actual thing you have to make that goes to something, that's hard to you know, stay motivated to, right? So for me, I mean, one of the reasons why I think I've, I've never been able to um, stop myself, you know, of, of constantly drawing is because everything I always produce now is, is mainly just for me. It may happen to be put into a book and it goes out to people that I think can buy. But at the end of the day, I'm not 
making it for other people first. I'm glad others can enjoy it, and I'm glad it's of a quality that people can, um, you know, expect more or request more. So I'm happy about that. But I can't make it morph or turn into something that is no longer something I just want to do for myself. Because if I if I went that direction, then I think I would lose motivation like most people do, right? Um, procrastination was always there for me. From youth to, especially like in college, right? Because when you're just a kid, like in high school, again, same thing. It's like, yeah, there's a little bit of pressure. But most of the times it's just like me and my friends are just drawing. Me and my friend drawing. So we would just make our own comics and stories and designs and stuff like that. Again, same thing. It was for us. Because of that, the, the procrastination wasn't really there. We did it all the time. I couldn't stop. But once I went to Art Center and went to college and all of a sudden we had these projects we had to do where they were not only intensive, but we had these strict deadlines. Then it's like, oh, shoot. But not only just deadlines, but I had like, you know, three or four classes at one time. So we have multiple projects going on simultaneously. So we had to prioritize because you couldn't do equal amount of work that you wanted to for all the things you had to do. Um, but still knowing that, there were times like, you know what, I know I have to do the work today, but you just don't feel it, right? And yes, I've had those feelings on many occasions when I was in college. And do I get that today still? To some degree. If it's something very official as a project. Even like this, I mean, again, to be blatantly honest with you guys, the Dynamic Bible too. You know, I get constant requests of like, when's that next book coming out? And I have definite interest in working on it. But that, it, that procrastination is still there. You know, I'm not going to deny that. There are times in which I got to work on it today. Man, I forget to. It's not that I don't want to. I forget. I'm sure that's the feeling that you guys have with procrastination. Is that it's not always a choice you make by saying, I don't want to work on this. It's more of a sense that all of a sudden you remember. It's like, oh, shoot, I, should, I was supposed to work on that. You forgot, right? Um, so I'll do it tomorrow. And so it kind of happens again. You just lose track of it, right? Because of the many other things that might be happening. Or because you're not feeling it as much as you would like to. Um, so how do you break that? And, and what did I do in those situations? Well, prioritization really was the key. I, I had to really choose uh, what I wanted to work on and where I had to invest my time. Um, and in some cases, you have to be very either diligent and be forceful, right? So I, I, even though I would want to procrastinate or, or not want to work on something, a lot of times you just had to sit there and just do it. It was painful. It, it was hard. It was hard to stick with it. It wasn't really to the quality that we liked. Um, but that's the reality of the job. Because in school, you're supposed to practice that to become ready enough to be able to experience this in the hardship of the real world. So that in the real world, it actually won't be as difficult compared to school. School is supposed to be doubly as hard, if not more so, than the real world. Because if you're able to get through school and it's pushing you to breaking points almost, right? In terms of the amount of hours you got to work on, being able to work on things you don't want to work on, and being able to force yourself sometimes at times in which you don't want to do it. That when you get to the real world, that all of a sudden it's like, actually, this is not as hard as it was in school. And that's what I found when I went in my own experience. Because Art Center was tough. Yeah, it... it almost broke a lot of people that I knew. Um, it pushed me to very extreme levels, you know, in terms of like how many hours we were working, how many days we were staying up. It was 24-7, you know. But I don't regret it. And I know some people are, are trying to avoid that sort of experience because to them it's like, well, that's not very healthy, you know, mentally, physically. And I understand that. And I agree to a certain level. I think a better balance should be there. But I'm also certainly going to say that my experience was very beneficial because it did give me and reinforce that, I guess, uh, what's the best word? Um, endurance, fortitude, right? I don't want to use uh, the, the, the hardening or a wall. That's not really the case. It's the, the endurance and fortitude for me to be able to go, right, and do it. And so in the real world, actually, things were not as difficult. They have their own challenges, of course, right? But it wasn't the same as like the amount of hours that we would put into something within a project for a class. Uh, it's just not the same. Um, so in that case, any project that I worked on, even like the book that I had to do, it's not the same amount of hours. But it has its own difficulties because everything is now dictated by you making the schedule when you start, how you pra uh, apply the schedule of the project, what you have to work on, what you have to submit. You know, all those things you have to plan out. 
we're in a class, it's all dictated for you. You know, this is the stuff you got to do and get it done by this deadline. Um, but when you're on your own, you know, it's, it's, I would say that that factor of difficulty, which is to micromanage everything else, is what is hard to get going because there's so much to think about, you know, other than actually just sitting and drawing. Uh, so the drawing part is not, is not hard for me. It's, you know, making sure everything is planned properly. <laughs> and that's the part in which I start to procrastinate because that to me is not as exciting compared to sitting and drawing, right? So I think that's in areas in which it can be hard to overcome. That procrastination or, or having the motivation when it's something that's unrelated to something you enjoy doing. But that's where, like I said, the experiences of being in a school or any sort of you know hardship that enables you to build up that endurance and also then the fortitude to do so, uh, you can break that, that kind of mindset at times and being able to just go. So I know at some point in this literal coming month or, or in the next couple of weeks, I have to break this. Now this mentality is like, I, I know I can get started. I got to get the book done soon, but I got to plan everything. But once I just start going, then I break that cycle. And then I'll, I'll be in it fully. Sorry, I'm just kind of going back a little bit. Mm. Greetings, Tyson. Uh, Milton, thank you for the donation. I appreciate that. Thank you for the coffee. Yeah. <laughs> appreciate uh, support for the channel and the questions as well, too. Uh, good questions are, are great for this because, again, like I said, I'm always interested in being able to share thoughts and opinions and, and questions are necessary. So good questions are always helpful for getting the momentum and the movement of this live stream interaction. So all good questions coming in. Decker, that the California Pen Show next week, actually, I have even no idea what's going on. <laughs> so thank you for even letting me know. I don't know if I'm going to make it next week. I would like to, now that I know. Uh, I was actually planning to go to a different show um, on, a, on a Saturday, which was a card show. It's in uh, Ontario. I'm really into cards, sport cards right now. So there's a convention coming up for sport cards uh, next weekend. It's this Burbank Sport Cards. You know, I go there just to like walk around, peruse, and look through cards and stuff like that. I just collect. So, but the pen show coming up, I might do that on Sunday. Yeah, so cool. In terms of uh, the update for then, the Dynamite Bible 2, it's going to be hopefully this summer. And so we're talking about procrastination and have I gotten started and how do I get started? Well, it's all there. And once I get started, it'll, it, I'll get through it pretty quickly. But it's that initial motivation and the initial uh, breaking of the procrastination. And it's because of the planning stage that I don't find it as fun. But once I break that, and I just kind of sit down and just do it, where I have to force myself, um, then, you know, I'll be able to really ramp it up. So I certainly feel those things now, still. In school, it was very much there. Uh, I would, you know, have a homework for class and I would play games, you know, so I did play video games when I was in college and stuff like this. Maybe not to an extent in which it was, you know, detrimental to my growth, but I certainly did still play games quite a bit. Uh, you know what game I played the most? It was, um, it was on the PlayStation 2 and I was always playing SOCOM. I don't think I remember that game. It was a third person shooter. It was one of the first like online, you know, kind of like what today is like Call of Duty and I don't know, Battlefield, but you know, that kind of shooting game. But back then SOCOM was the game I played. So you play online with a really crappy connection. Um, I, I don't know why I always, I, I found that one to be really fun. The very first one, so come one. And KSCO, thank you for your donation as well too. Uh, not a problem for answering your question. You've been bringing a lot or binging a lot of streams over the last few months. Great, well I hope you'll continue to come back. <clears throat> SOCOM 2 was pretty good as well. But for some reason, the first one, man, I was infatuated by it. I would play it for hours <laughs> back then. This is in 2002, 2001. What we're doing right now is just kind of pushing some of the detail work on the dragon head at the moment. Uh, if we, people that are just kind of joining, you'll see the rest of the image here. 
I'm going to keep pushing it on this. Now I'll start to kind of move more linearly through it. So at first we started with the guy's arm, and then we went to the head. We finished his pose, went to the dragon, turned to the body, finished this guy out, went to the rest of the body form. Now I'm back to the beginning. So here at this part, I'm going to reinforce all the detail. This will now hit this guy over here. I'm going to push his line work a little bit more. Then it will trail off. And I'll just touch upon the small stuff back then, but most of this down here, I'm not touching. I don't need to. All this back here is set. So all the focal point will go right in there. So let's go back and zoom in. Let's see, a couple of questions here. Uh, so Average Kirby Enjoyer asks, you watched the video by Chris Oakley about preliminary work, specifically on how Line Decker prepared his paintings. Do I do preliminary drawings? Uh, it's situational. Depends on the piece. A lot of times, again, I mentioned earlier, if it's for a client, they're hiring me to do an illustration, uh, then yes, I will do preliminary sketches, drawings, studies, to show them. So that way they can give me feedback as to what they're looking for. Because that piece is not for me. It's for them. They're hiring me to do it for them. So I have to make sure that I'm hitting their, their um, concepts, their ideas. It's, it's getting close to what they're looking for as an idea. Because they themselves don't really know. So I have to give them possibilities, right? Possibilities of concepts. So then, of course, sketches come into play. For myself, as much, not as much. Uh, if I'm doing like a live drawing, let's say like a gallery or a convention, you know, I buy those really big canvases and I draw them live. I, I think about the idea, but I don't necessarily plan out sketches to do them. I just go straight in there. It's so like this one here. I drew something yes or not yesterday, the day before, similar of an of an idea. It was a dragon and it was like a guy carrying it on a, on a pole. Uh, and I did a full drawing of it. It wasn't a sketch preparing to do this one. It was just another drawing just from the idea of what I wanted to share earlier. But for the stream, it's like, well, I still want to do something live for Chinese New Year. Um, which is why I kind of fell back on that same kind of idea. But the drawing is different. For the posting on Instagram, uh, I'll post both. I'll post this image and I'll also post the other one I had done before this drawing. And you'll see what I'm talking about. The other drawing is not a sketch. It wasn't something done prior for this stream. Uh, it was just something I had done because I wanted to. It just happened that the drawing we're doing now is related. The same concept, the same idea. So I guess it could be seen as almost like two instances or two illustrations of the same idea. I wish I could show you guys um, some of the other pens I'm working with right now. And they're sitting over here like these ones actually. These are from the same company, from uh, Esterbrook. This one over here was actually a special collab. Uh, there's a company called um, Ferritus. Fairy Tales. Fairy Tales. And uh, they make an ink. And so they had a collaboration with this company, Esterbrook. And this pen, this is a F size nib, special collab, I bought, which is what I'm using now. These ones are my personal carry also, too, but the nibs are special prototypes. So I can't show you these because uh, it's not been approved just yet and I've been testing them for months. So I'm trying to collaborate with Esterbrook myself. And if, if everything goes according to plan, um, we'll be doing a collab release of a pen under me. So it'll be a, a branded pen for, for Esterbrook by me. So it's an artist fountain pen, which you can't really find out there. Uh, in terms of fountain pens, one I would say Ferris Wheel. Thank you, Jay Decker. Uh, Ferris, this one says like Fairy Tales. So this is for this particular pen, Fairy Tales, but Ferris Wheel is, is the brand. Um, this one in particular, I would say, is the only fountain pen that would be considered truly a artist fountain pen. So this one is made by Pilot. And this is a Falcon nib. So the Falcon nibs are pretty well known within our industry, within professionals. Uh, and this is a great pen. Um, this is made by Pilot. And this is the 912 Custom. It's not cheap. Something like this, I've, I've had customized more. It's got like little additional adjustments and grinds and all that sort of stuff. This is like a $400 pen. <laughs> okay, so uh, 
this is something I would you know recommend. But this is really the only fountain pen that most artists would turn to as a fountain pen, you know. But this one over here, these Esther books, this nib <clears throat> is not like an unknown nib, so it's not a brand new design or something like that. But they're they're sending me a couple to test out what I would consider using an artist. And these nibs over here, I quite like. So once it's ready, you'll see more about it in the future at some point. But for now, just do know that um, fountain pens like this don't really have a lot of flex, so the the line is actually quite thin. So I have to kind of work into it back and forth just to build up that you know line weight and shadow. Uh, but with the other pens over there, the nibs are a lot more um, they have a lot more variables on line. So anyways, that will come in the future. So we're just gonna push this shadow shape underneath here. And we'll just keep going. I don't know how much hatching I'll do, probably to a degree. You can start to see some parts here that has it. But I'm not gonna go crazy with the hatching. So Militant, the footy nib is the kind of nib we're talking about. <laughs> so I can't show you the one here from Esther Book, but basically the footy nib is the type that we're using. Um, but it's a custom footy nib uh, made by their own nib makers under the company. But footy nibs in general, uh, I haven't had a huge amount of experience of. I used to use footy nibs back in like the early 2000s, but it was like a cheap Chinese knockoff pen. Uh, but I loved it. It was a really nice pen. And since that time, for some reason, I kind of like didn't really use them as much. I just used regular fountain pens like this. But a few of them exist, but there aren't a lot out there. You know, there's a few made by Pilot, there's a few made by Sailor. But in the US, of course, you know, they don't really make Fude style nibs uh, as much. They, I think, have a few now, but um, I didn't really find them regularly, which is probably why I didn't really turn to them. But Fude nibs are mostly more calligraphic. Right? So the strokes you put down have a lot of taper to them. And for artists, I think the footing nib is probably one of the best to go to. So the pens that we're using here from Esther Book are footing nibs. Uh, so I'm testing the ones they, they grounded or grinded for me. And uh, if I can improve with them, we're going to move forward with production. And uh, those are the ones I would brand as artist fountain pens. So it's a good question, Milton. You predicted it. <laughs> Yeah, the footing nibs are something else. If you get it just right, the angling is what's really what I'm testing. Uh, I didn't bring it with me here, unfortunately. It's in my bag. I've been using one of the cheaper ones made by Pilot. But the angle of the footing nib is too severe. So to hold it and to get the stroke that I want was really hard, actually. So it's one of the comparisons I'm giving it to them as feedback. Um, the one I have from Esterbrook is not as slanted. It's a bit more gentle. It's cool to hear about your process, Baked Beans. Yeah, it's interesting to read about your sketching process right now, going straight in. It's cool. Best thing to do in these situations like this, when people ask, like, how do I train to just go straight in and draw like you're doing with pens? It's like, well, just do it. <laughs> just sketch. Uh, draw without the expectation, but just practice and see what comes out first. And repetition from there. Repetition is everything. The more you do it, the more you repeat. You start to pick up on certain sensitivities, uh, things you can do to correct on mistakes that you don't like as much. Uh, and don't feel negative about the stuff that comes out bad, but learn from it and move forward to the next one. So we're in about maybe two hours in. So time has gone by pretty quickly here. Uh, we're going to go for maybe another half an hour at the most, and then we'll be ending our stream for today. Um, if anybody has any other additional questions, things you want to talk about, let me know. I'm just going to keep working on a bit more of this headpiece down to about here. Uh, once I get up to that much, we'll be calling it done soon. Yeah, you should play with everything, as you know, cool disciple was mentioning. Over time, what happens is you start to isolate preferences, things you just like. So just because you see people drawing straight in with ink, 
doesn't mean it's the best way. It's just the way they like to do things, you know? But you might find that you also like to do it in, in its own way. It has a lot of training benefit. Um, going straight ink is the reason why I teach that way. There's a reason why I do that. But, you know, beyond that, then going down to your preferences of what drawing tools you go for, then you choose, you know? And you might end up just preferring ink. And of course, that's fine. But yeah, play with all tools and you start to get a sense about what seems to work well with you. Uh, your thinking process and what you like to create and generate. And of course, it's good to have a lot of influences of other artists that you see and kind of mimicking what they're trying to do because that's how you learn. Sally's asking, how do you know if you don't overwork uh, work the piece? Are you kind of asking like how do you stop from overworking it? Or I guess, if, how do you know that you've like underdeveloped it, right? I mean, for me, it's, um, if it's something that's underdeveloped, not overworked, it's more of like certain elements pop up to me of like a nagging feeling. You know, I kind of want to remedy the clarity of information of something, right? So for me, like right here, this section in the, in the torso and the face of this guy, it's... I could leave it and it'd be fine, but I still kind of feel like, ah, oh, I kind of want to clarify some information there. There's a nagging feeling of it, right? But then how do you stop is the other question. I notice that when I start drawing and I begin to nitpick, doing small little nicks um, is a sign in which you're done because there's, there's no more to really solve or answer anymore. Uh, you're just now just putting time in without realizing that you're doing so. You have to be able to put yourself in the position of intention first. What are you trying to do, right? What is it for? What do you need? Content-wise or, or subject matter-wise, line-wise, information-wise, the questions have to be presented earlier. And so as you have all those questions of intention as to what you're trying to do, you try to execute them. And once you've executed them, well, then eventually those problems are solved and you're sitting there still working on it. But now you no longer have thoughts about what you're even trying to do. You're just spending time. So you're making marks and little nicks of details and more and more line work and more and more shadow, even though those things haven't been solved, but you don't stop yourself. So you have to be able to kind of give yourself a moment to step back at times. So this is why you should be working in like, let's say like half an hour chunks. Every half an hour, stop, put your pen down, step away. Look at it from a distance. Every artist and teacher will tell you this. Look at it from far away, you know, because then you'll give you a different vision of it. Because sometimes you're nose close to the thing, right? And so you're so close in detail, tell them a vision, that you lose sight about what you're trying to do. So every half an hour, stop yourself, step away from it, think about the questions you intended. If you didn't have any, establish them, right? Once you've established them, then go back into it. If you have to work on more, then work on more. If you've answered those questions, there's nothing else I can think about to do, you're done. Don't look for more questions. Eventually, over time, what might happen is you'll look back on old work and realize, hey, you know what? I didn't solve that part. And I should have worked on it more. But that's afterwards. After maturity of time and experience, you realize those things. You take that information, you apply it to the next piece, right? But I will say this, Stanley. Uh, as an educator who's been teaching, sketching, and drawing for over 15 years, uh, what I usually tell my students is, it's actually better to overwork your piece. Okay? Any sketch of study, any illustration, in the beginning stages of your training, it's better, in my opinion, that you overwork it. Work it to death. And the reason why is because you're looking for the spectrum. The spectrum from one end is the base, the construction. On the other side of the spectrum is you taking it to the extreme levels of being overworked. What you're looking for, depending on the situation or what you're working on, maybe it's an illustration for a client, for yourself, for a book, or whatever the case is, it fits in that spectrum somewhere how much work you got to work into it, right? It's either going to be really, really over, like heavily, you know, dense of line and information of detail, or it's going to be just a base shape and form because you're trying to understand proportion or anatomy or something like this. Depending on the situation, your intent of how much completion you have to do is going to be on that line of spectrum. But you got to know that spectrum. So you have to know how simple and basic it is to how far and crazy you can go with it. You may never always want to do the crazy extreme level of information 
overworkedness. It's never appropriate. But somewhere in between that, you got to know. But if you have to know that spectrum. So establishing how far that is and recognizing that. It's like, hey, I overworked this. You know, this is way too much. You have to know that feeling. You have to see it. So don't be afraid to take work too far. Because if you do so, you haven't taken it to the limit as to like what that line is. So then you'll always be hesitant and not maybe work on a level in which you could do more, right? So establish that first. Then with any additional work in the future, you can establish your intent as to where on that line to go. My study right now is to only study the shape and the form of the dragon. On that spectrum, I'm going to stick right over here in the le far left. It is an illustration for some sort of client poster work, and they want a full illustrated piece. I want to go a little bit further. Anyways, that's what my class, that's what we talk about <laughs> in sketching and drawing. Because, uh, you know, dynamic sketching that I teach is all about study-based methods. But study, you know, has varying degrees of levels of finish. And it could be simply of shape and form to a high level of information. But they're all studies because we're trying to understand something. That's what a sketch is. So that means every stage of a drawing has value. Even the most basic and crude sketch you can make that's based on just simply understanding form and shape and is roughly drawn is equally as valuable as something that's overly rendered or overworked. These are things I talk about in my class all the time. So I repeat this and for those of you that have been in my class in the past that are here with me today, uh, you guys have heard me talk about that. So repetitive, I know. Question, have I, have I found that it works better to do multiple folio personal projects at a time or devote a certain amount of time to one project? Uh, one at a time, I would say. I think that's going to be the best approach. You can have multiple projects, but I think multiple, uh, having one done and moving on is something I like to do. At the same time, it's all about how your brain tends to function. For some people, they like to have multiple projects because it keeps them interested as they fluctuate from one thing to the other thing to the other thing. Because you might exhaust that idea for a little bit. If you spend like multiple days in that week's own project, you kind of get bored, you know, because monotonous. So you kind of want to change the scenery. So you go to something else. For myself, I like to work on one thing and get it done. So I go from a linear order. I have multiple projects, but I'm going to get to that point once this one's done. That's how I just work. But that's not saying that that's the best way to do it, right? So what we're talking about here is then finding your process and how you feel about how your working mentality is. And how you discover that is by trying it, experimenting with different ways of how you work. So sometimes you might you know, work on multiple projects at once, or sometimes you'll focus on one project at a time. And through that experience, this is done in education, of course, right? So the more you do it in education, the more data you're receiving, you get to know more about yourself and how you do it. So that's why in education, they always say like you should do it with education with the, with the intent of failing because you want to find the things that work and don't work for you. Just because some instructor tells you how they do it doesn't mean that's the way you should do it. You can try. You should follow it because that's what the whole class is about. But from there, you have to have the maturity and the, and the decision making by saying, I took this class multiple times and I think this bit of information worked for me, but the rest of it is whatever. So you drop it. And that's fine. You know, people who take my classes, I don't want them to draw exactly like me. I don't want them to think like me. I want them to be themselves. They can do it the way I'm doing it now in terms of my class exercises and whatnot. And from that exercise of experience, you then can make the decision what worked and what didn't work. It's an environment, a safe environment for you to try and fail because there is no judgment. Let's see, uh, do you agree on the saying that drawing is like a sport and we artists are like athletes? Yes, yes. And actually, uh, the last live stream, I talked actually a good amount about that, didn't I? How I 
kind of like use the analogy of sports and how we are considered more like athletes because the analogy of that really gives better people a better context of how the extreme you know level change you're talking about here you know because anybody can play sports for fun i can go outside and shoot basketball but i'm never going to be a, be a pro nba athlete you know so imagine that you know in in a parallel to what we do in the art and design world you know there are people out there men and women there are levels in which their skills can be considered like that and even within our field there are many varying ranges of it you know and even within the professional field it doesn't mean you can't be a professional you can but the levels in which the the, the ranges of skill difference will be huge at times so like i said you know there are people out there artists and draftsmen and designers and thinkers that are far better than me you know but we also have certain strengths and weaknesses we all have certain roles we can play like in sports and we understand we can take advantage of them i know what my strengths are so i'm able, I'm able to really play that up and be a level of confidence that people can then understand but also be confident in hiring me because they know what they're getting from me Tyson's asking, would you recommend getting a tablet or waiting till you get good with traditional art? Also because you don't like having a bunch of papers around. I would actually stay, say with, uh, with digital, starting with a iPad and Procreate would be more recommended. I mean, unless you have a decent computer already in Photoshop, then yeah, get a tablet. Um, but should you wait until you're better with analog? No. If you have the means and the financial means to, to afford such a, a tool, then get it now. Use that while you're using the traditional tools because doing them both would actually work better together than one after the other, in my opinion. Sorry, there's a cache out of there, you can't see it very well. How can I move that light to my left? We're slowly getting there. Sorry, the conversational part, me talking probably overtakes the drawing a bit more. So I apologize for some people that just want to watch the drawing. But as we're doing so, let me see if there's any other questions. And I've been trying lately to relearn anatomy with the goal of memorizing it and being able to draw the human figure from memory. What's the best way to draw with the goal with that intent? Um, well, first and foremost, unless you're like an anatomy nut like you're obsessed with anatomy you're not gonna remember all of it <laughs> okay uh i remember maybe like i don't know really if anything less than half percentage wise about all of the human anatomy i know just the major muscles right pectoral trapezius you know the serratus muscles the abdominal wall obliques and latissimus deltoid bicep just the major muscles but there's many muscles in between that which i don't know the name of all of them so unless you're like, you know, a medical student, right, trying to do illustrations for uh, medical books of, of anatomy, then yeah, you're going to want to know all of it. Or you're teaching, you know, the, the anatomical information. You want to know all of it because you're going to teach it, right? Uh, I don't teach anatomy. I teach human pose and camera and dynamics of action, but we use basic anatomy, but we don't use all of it. So that's the first thing you have to get into your mind, which is, how much do you even want to know? If you love it to the degree, well, then you'll kind of uh, revolve your entire life on just learning anatomy because it's, it's a lifelong endeavor at that point. But if what you want to do is maybe like design characters or draw illustrations for covers of books or something like this, you just have to know enough to be able to convey the understanding of how the human form works, whether anatomically or whether through pose or whether through, you know, um, other sort of visual things you might need for that piece. But again, I don't need all of it. I just need just the portion of which you can see, right? So then, um, of course, I'm not going to shy away from using certain references if I need to for certain cases like that or re-educating myself if I have to go to it because I, I have poor memory. I have to go back and remind myself all the time. 
And that's the thing about this is that you'll never master it, really. I mean, there's some you can say that do, but you're talking about a small 1% of people that are just that prolific. I'm not that, you know, I'm not that 1%. Um, I'm capable of doing certain things, but I'm not good at everything. And my memory is not that great. So when it comes to anatomy or perspective, I'm not a master at that stuff. I just know them well enough to be able to manipulate them. That's the key word. I can manipulate it. I can play with it. But just enough is all I need. But, you know, other than that, I mean, yeah, you can take classes over and over and over again. Um, but I think the key advice would be application. What we're talking about is finding out where all that channels to. What are you using it for, right? If you're looking to do portraiture and, and you know, uh, human study work to be paintings in a gallery, then that's what you should produce. Start actually producing it while you're actually taking classes on anatomy. Now, I want to design characters. Well, start even designing characters from imagination and try to apply that information as you go. And then how much do you really need? So as you're applying it, it'll give you the understanding uh, of the depth of that content you need to be able to memorize, right? <clears throat> I mean, for something like this, this dragon I'm making, do I know the true anatomy of an animal of a serpentine thing like this? I mean, no. <laughs> I've seen snakes and I've seen mythological animals being drawn in culture. And I just pull from that from memory to a degree, but because I've just drawn it over and over and over again, you know? But do I know the trueness of how this works biologically? It's a fantasy animal. Of course not. You know, we can make it up. But we can give the implications related to nature and just elements of it. Scales, you know? It's got a snake body. <laughs> it's got, you know, um, I mixed a bunch of animals together. I'm sure a lot of you guys will know Marshall, Marshall Vandruff. And he kind of talks about, you know, the balance between educating yourself and then being able to just create. I think Marshall talked about this, you know, talks about this really, really well. Because um, he's someone who lectures amazingly. And his depth of understanding of the content is so strong. And he's always someone who, is, who always says that he doesn't really, let's say he's not considered someone who's, you know, a very proficient draftsman or painter but you know he's, he's obviously competent um but for him it's his love of, of the information you know the love of the process uh and he talks about it all the time he's like even though he can know it very well i mean how much of he's really really using it's far less than you might think but there are standards you know in our industry and those standards usually you would pick up on as an understanding of how much you got to learn through school, through education. This is why learning under professionals, people that have actually had industry jobs or already are in industry currently, is what you should be learning from. So if you're going through classes in education of people that have no industry experience, be very careful. I mean, it seems that sounds obvious, but you'd be surprised of how many people out there now you know, we'll, we'll establish, you know, YouTube videos or online classes or experiences of like gumroads or things that they'll share. And it, it looks legit, you know, they can spruce it up and make it really pretty. But how much experience do they really have? And um, this is not about skill because they could probably draw really well. But the problem is, even though they can draw really well, it doesn't mean they understand the industry. It doesn't, doesn't mean they understand how much they have to use to apply. Because if you're looking, what you're looking for is a job, maybe. Let's say you want to go into the industry as a professional. But if you're learning under somebody who's never actually done that. But yeah, granted, they, maybe they're technically very good. But they have no context about what it actually takes to work in that field. That's poor education, in my opinion. You know? And just because you can draw and paint well is not enough at times. So how do you avoid that stuff? Research. Research and sharing of um, experiences. So if you guys have like a Discord you go to with other artists, you can kind of share your educational experiences, talk about the instructors you've had. That's how you learn, you know, word of mouth. Because when I was in school at Art Center, you know, I, I took classes because it was based on somebody saying that, hey, this is 
right up your alley. This class information is right up, you know, right for you. But then instructor was someone who was obviously going to be a professional because I went to a college in which they were all professionals. But today in, in online education, you got to get word of mouth for both things. The, the content of the class, but then who the educator is. Someone, you know, people that I would recommend that teach classes with feedback specifically, you know, places like the Concept Design Academy in Pasadena online is good. Brainstorm is good. CGMA is, is solid. You know, it's got feedback. Uh, most of the people there are, you know, professionals. <clears throat> but um, certain individual people like Kirk Shinmoto, great instructor. Brian Lee, great instructor. Um, and again, I'm talking about classes that give feedback, right? Because there's a lot of artists out there, professionals that do videos, and that's great content, but it's not feedback education. Someone who's hands-on. That's what I think really you need to experience at least several times. You know, So Marshall is a good instructor, but he doesn't do feedback, right? So I still would recommend guys like Marshall, but for different purposes, to get information, but not to actually get viable feedback to improve your work hands-on so guys like aaron blaze great designer amazing artist fantastic lecturer uh huge amounts of experience but it doesn't give feedback in a class it's all videos that you would just pay for and watch so how is that any different than you know watching someone like on a gumroad video or you know skillshare thing mike hernandez is a very good teacher he's one of my teachers back in the arts in the days highly recommend him Worked at DreamWorks for God knows how long, decades. <laughs> but I still recommend Aaron because Aaron Blaze is, you know, highly, highly valuable in, in, in information. But once you get the information experience, what you need to get at some point in the future is class experience that actually gets hands on. Okay. So for those of you that are going online right now, uh, starting off by going for the cheap stuff, the free things, fantastic. Start with that. But at some point, you're going to have to actually move into um, a level of experience that can be more engaging, possibly more intensive, challenging, you know? Because if you just watch videos, it's really not that challenging. You're just watching and copying. And it's set to you to challenge yourself. And the only challenge you establish is doing more, right? You watch a video, it's like, oh, I'll draw 10 more pages. But that kind of challenge become, can become over, uh, overcome actually in a short period of time. The challenges in, are in other things. You know, application again is one of those areas. Dropbox is a great place to begin, but it's not a great place to excel beyond the ceiling that they've established in Dropbox. But I'm not going to say that you shouldn't use Dropbox. In the beginning, it's a great place to just start. It gets you comfortable. It gets you exposed to the, the content of information that I've been sharing to them back in the day. Um, so it's, there's nothing wrong with that. But for those of you that are like hobbyists, it's like, oh, I don't want to be professional. I just want to draw for myself. Then none of this matters to you. It doesn't apply. But for those of you that are interested in being, you know, actual professionals or working in the industry for yourself or, you know, making some kind of like viable career out of this thing, it's got to become more serious at some point. Yeah, books are the same thing. It's no different than a video. It's just information. You can read it and you can study it and you can copy and paste it, but you're not there hands-on to show like how, how does it apply to you, right? And you need somebody there with the industry experience to kind of navigate that information for you. Because the book and the video will never change. It's set as it is. Senor Ermac is saying, you know, I've met a few people that constantly talk about all the videos they watch and courses they do, but they only draw a few hours a week. Seems like a minimum real work. And, and I would say that is a minimum. And then again, same thing earlier, as I mentioned, is that it, it has a ceiling to it. Because the information as it's set, you know, you would only just copy and paste. You don't understand what are the, how much of the information really applies to you, what you really need to reinforce, and what you need to make adjustments to because everybody approaches things slightly differently based on how you perceive the information 
physically even how you are as well too how you move and how you should you know how many hours you even sit there kind of thing if you have questions that book or video won't tell you right it only has set information based on what it is which is supposed to cover a generality general people but specifically to you the only way to get that is when you're sitting with somebody in a classroom and they can look at your work by saying hey the way you're thinking here or the way you're moving there what you did right there how many hours you worked or what you're doing on this part all those things i would tell you what you need to make adjustments on Now, it sounds like, well, yeah, that's obvious, and, but the problem is money. Of course it is. You know, if we had all the money in the world, there wouldn't be much of a problem, right? But you can't just pay for all the classes you just want to, and I understand that. All I'm saying is that at some point in time, you will have to invest, right? And maybe it'll take you years to even just take a handful of classes you just save money for. But if you love it that much, you will do so. But I get that it's not so easy to take um, because you're not in life circumstance, maybe in a situation to do so. But on your own timeline, based on your own finances, hopefully you will have good experiences like that. So Prisa, yeah, I hope you have a good experience, you know, and I think being very proactive on interacting with people on there, asking questions and sharing work is, you know, a big part about being able to have a good experience through Dropbox, I hope. Uh, and then from there, you know, whenever you come to the class, you're, you're very much welcome. And hopefully I will help you as much as I can uh, when and if you do come in. You know, these sort of like live streams that we're doing right now is not that much different than what my online classes are like, except it's, of course, more structured, you know, and we have actual work we got to do. Uh, where here is just more like questions and answers sort of thing, and you just watch me draw. Um, but the vibe of it, you know, in terms of like how involved I get with the, the individual people, I mean, this is what it is, you know. I, I want to make sure I spend the time making sure all the questions and the things you need to be doing are resolved so that you have a game plan to move on to the next week, you know, and then beyond. Just know that education is not about finding an answer. It's about gaining experience. And from that experience, there's no end goal just yet. It's about having the tools on being able to establish your own working momentum going to the future. It's not an answer. It's a guide, it's direction. It's about seven o'clock right now. I'm gonna go for maybe just a little bit more. This is the last maybe 10 minutes. So we're just only just hitting this part right now. Let's zoom out real quickly again. See it. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna push some of the dark behind him just to like push his silhouette forward a little bit more. And Sethams, you know, books are very much viable because it's good information. You know, as our videos, as our other artists and professionals putting out tutorials out there, it's good information. And it can be very helpful and useful if you follow it and you practice it multiple times. But again, it has a ceiling. Once you hit that ceiling, you can't do with any as content because there's no new information. It's just the same video and the same book over and over again. But of course, absolutely, books and videos are tremendously helpful. Back in the day, you know, when, when I was in Art Center, uh, this is in the early 2000s, you know, we didn't have, of course, YouTube and, you know, Instagram and that sort of stuff. Uh, but what we did have was the Nomen DVDs. Uh, those were our Gumroad videos, you know. So we'd buy the DVDs and we watched them. And a lot of the artists we used to watch were guys like Ryan Church and Feng Zhu and um, a lot of designers that were on like Star Wars and stuff like that, um, Ian the Keg, those were some of the people that we looked up to. So we used to watch those videos all the time because back then there was no, you know, real actual like concept art books, educational. Uh, there were, yeah, fundamental books on drawing and painting, but, you know, within what we wanted to do, it didn't exist. So those Nomen DVDs were gold to us because even though we didn't actually learn real um, process at times, but we just got to watch. 
and by watching because they didn't talk it was all just like them doing it with music in the background you know so uh we would just watch and we just imitate I did a gum or not a gum I'm sorry. I did a Noman DVD after I graduated, two thousand six, and I was inexperienced. I had just gotten out of school, and they gave me a chance to work on a Noman DVD, uh, designing a character. You guys will be able to find that content on on Google. It's pretty bad stuff now. Uh, I look back on that work, it's like, oh my gosh. It's not. I don't mind looking at it, but at the time, it's like you know, it's so far back. You know, you kind of get secondhand embarrassment. Knowing that it's also out there permanently in the internet, you know. Kind of watch out for what you post up there sometimes or what you make. So yeah, Jolly was asking, you know, do you think that watching videos and reading books and making your own notes would be a helpful way of learning? Yeah, absolutely. Yes, for sure. But it's not enough. Because <laughs> I guess another way to put it is, would I have been able to make it to where I am by only going through books and videos? I don't think so. I mean, I guess I can say it like this also. I could, I could have, but it would have taken me way longer. Way longer. Question from OK OK is what is your advice on overcoming the habit of over planning for a drawing assignment? You tend to dive too deep on reference photo search and small sketches. Um, working in teams and working with other people. So that way someone is there to be able to check you because uh, they might be working on a similar project and you can be working on the same kind of momentum because there could be someone, let's say a friend who is maybe better on being able to keep track of what they're doing or at least both of you can remind each other as to what you need to be doing at that time. Um, that would be my first recommendation, which is to be able to work with others around you with similar kind of things you're doing. So that means in a classroom, uh, making friends in a class is extremely, extremely important. So that way, as you get similar assignments, you could work on them together or at the very least check in on each other. If you're working on your own personal things, still inviting or incorporating uh, other people it doesn't mean that they're working on your stuff it just means that they're working on their own practice also but you'll meet up maybe like once a week saying checking hey where are you at what are you working on and maybe you'll meet online um, for me being in school having people and friends around me was the most important aspect and what i got the most out of being in college that's what i was really paying for connection and socializing in that way uh, because they're the people that i know now after you know 20 plus years that are in the industry in their heads of you know of companies and stuff like this so um i think on that side of, of you know making sure that you don't tend to deep dive too far into one little aspect of something you need reminders to kind of push you out of that sometimes people do it on their own through scheduling you know alarms and time established deadlines by saying only this one day i'll do this and by the end of it no matter what where i'm at i have to move on you can do that too but i think working with other people is better Having extra set of eyes helps tremendously also uh, based on, you know, questions of what you're even doing, <laughs> if it's even working, because you, you get tunnel vision, as you said, you know, you're unable to even see the quality anymore. You're just seeing the same thing over and over again. So having other eyes are really, really good. Feedback, right? Feedback is not just from like professionals and teachers. You need feedback from just even your peers. How do they respond? Do they like it? Is it consistent? Is it working? They don't have to fix it for you, but it's just another pair of eyes to make sure that you know what you're doing is on track. Uh, let's see. 
do you think, it's a question here, that as a student, one should be balancing between personal projects and study, or is it okay to solely focus on a curriculum coursework for a good while and default to only study? I think for myself, I've always uh, integrated personal stuff, you know, even while I was studying, but it varied tremendously, right? Because at times in which I was in a classroom and I had an actual project to work on, you know, I still did my own stuff, but it was relegated to be a lot more simple by just sketching things, right? It wasn't me trying to develop a whole project. Uh, other times what I would try to do to integrate it more fully was to use my own personal project into class homework as well too. So I try to hybrid them sometimes. So that way it's something that's still personal and being applied to a class project. Uh, but if it's two separate things, <clears throat> then I would say, you know, I would say solely focusing on the study at first should be the priority. But then any extra time that you have for yourself to just sketch loosely, just have fun. It could be focused on things that you're working on for yourself, but it can accumulate. It's just studies, sketches, ideas, concepts that by the time you actually then have a time of a break, you're done with class, then you would prioritize your own project, but you still have done some sketches to keep building some idea of it, right? So it's all of that balancing of time uh, based on situational and being able to prioritize properly. Senior Ermac is asking, am I normally a book learner or a visual? Visual. All visual. Uh, I mentioned this last time about sports, same thing too, is that I'm so much of a visual learner that I can watch somebody do something physical because I like sports a lot. I like playing it. Uh, that I can react, not react, but reenact the, the visual movement because I played with it in my mind so much. I'm practicing the movement in my head. So when I actually have to physically do it, I actually can pick it up and do it relatively quickly. I fumble a little bit in the beginning, but I can actually really engage in it real fast. So I'm not physically large in stature, but um, my athleticism is actually pretty good. Uh, I don't have great balance, but um, I'm usually short runner, fast speed, obviously cliche, but still that was kind of my strengths. Um, but I picked up on the, the physical movements really well. So all sports I enjoyed from like, when I was a kid, I loved baseball, to basketball, to soccer, to football. I loved playing all of them. If I had to take it to an actual, like, not professional, but I was, if I was playing as a kid in organized sports, I'm sure I would have done well, actually. But I don't know how much I would have enjoyed it. Okay, we're almost done here. I mean, after this stream, I usually end up working on the pieces just a little bit more. So I can just kind of like refine it, focus on it, whatever the case is. For this piece, I might do so. I might not have to. We'll see. But what I wanted to just do for now was to make sure that this guy was just kind of popped out a little bit more. And we're gonna be wrapping up here real soon. Here's the full drawing so far. Yeah, once we're done, I'm probably gonna just kind of clean up a little bit this area, a bit down here, a bit more information to detail. I'll probably even bring my other pens. I'm gonna push that line weight a bit more. But here is our Chinese New Year dragon flying through the air, being supported by these uh, individuals, characters. I kind of imagined this at first being a dragon, like a puppet, and it became like this cloud elemental thing. So they're kind of holding it up, flying in the air, but um, fun. Any books you recommend how to learn how to draw? Well, here's what I don't recommend at first. And it's one that people have really fall into, which was the, the How to Draw book from Scott Robertson. I am not saying it's a bad book. Scott Robertson is an amazing designer, and that book can be amazing. But for beginning to learn how to draw, I don't recommend it. It's way too overwhelming, okay? And it's also so specifically focused on just vehicle and props. It's, it's hard to apply them to like, well, I want to draw animals. If I asked you to use that book information and apply to animals, you would be trying to fit a cube into a circle, you know? Uh, for, for It'd be hard to apply that. Um, one book I would recommend actually is one we used to use in Art Center called Rapid Viz. Rapid Viz, V-I-Z. 
It's a red cover book. It's similar to the content what I do in my dynamic sketching class. That's where my mentor Norm got a lot of inspiration uh, for some of the stuff from this class for dynamic sketching. Then of course, yes, you know, there's my dynamic Bible, but um, you know, it's not so easily available right now. So as much as I, I would like to be able to have it in stock for some people that are looking for it right now, I think they're going through the printing process. So be patient. And the second book will also come out soon. Um, I'm planning five volumes of the dynamic Bible. So yeah. So yeah, that how to draw book again is great, but it's not for beginners. Um, there are those other ones for the human anatomy. Uh, they're little mini books. I think they were from Asia. I don't remember. It's like a white cover with some base form drawings, and they would do like you know torsos or arms, and they're actually really well drawn and do a lot of form building. I can't remember the name unfortunately, so I can't recommend it as to what the actual name is, but I do remember that. Rapid Viz, Rapid. R A P I D Viz V I Z. Yeah, some thunder effects, lightning effects, or just visual effects would be kind of fun too. I, I usually throw those in afterwards at the end. This kind of gives you this sense of movement energy, visual effects. I'm kind of already there somewhat to a degree around here, but I'll probably add a bit more to it. <clears throat> Morpho, thank you, Mina, that's it. I haven't, I haven't actually looked at those books a lot of times. I, every time I go to a bookstore, I see them every now and again. I just kind of skim through, it's like, oh, it's pretty cool. Yeah, if I was a student, I'd probably look at some of those, the Morpho books. Uh, the Tom Fox Anatomy book, I don't know so well. I, I know of his work. Seems good, you know. So, you know, if the book is there, it's, it's something affordable to you. Nothing wrong with looking at it. But like I said, for myself, like I, I don't necessarily always give recommendations to things I've never really looked at or experienced. So um, if other people can recommend them, hey, by all means, do so. Uh, did I do a thumbnail for this piece? I did not. So you can watch the, the stream later on when it gets posted on YouTube. You can watch from the beginning. So we're going to end up here real soon. It's about 2.40 our time right now, or two, and 2 hours, 40 minutes uh, into our stream. But we're at this level at this point. And uh, once we wrap up here, the recording of this will automatically go to the YouTube channel. It'll be kind of a low-res version of it, but it'll once it processes, it'll be all high-res. And you can watch from the beginning again and kind of see where I started with this piece and talk all about it. Um, next time I'll be on, well, my classes begin next Monday. For those of you that are looking for classes to start, uh, and that could be like the sit-in seats to, just to be able to participate and watch and get the lectures. Uh, if you're looking for feedback, some of the classes are somewhat open still. Dynamic sketching is kind of filled up right now. I think there's like one more seat open on like a Wednesday class. Uh, my creature design class is relatively open and the figure drawing class is a few more seats left over. But everything else um, is a, uh, let's see, let's put it, is, is sit-in seats. So you can observe, you can, you can watch and you can do the work, but you don't get feedback. But that's why it's a lot cheaper. Um, but my classes don't begin until next week on Tuesday. So once we begin, it'll be eight weeks. And the next time I have another round of classes will be around May. So we'll be starting around the midpoint early May and then going for the spring term. So that's session two. Uh, and that'll be upcoming. So if you guys are interested in classes in the future, they are ongoing through the year. I usually have four sessions at a time. All you got to do is follow my Instagram and you'll notice posts on there popping up. But unfortunately, my algorithm is terrible right now. It's, it's completely beating me to death. Uh, so I'm sure a lot of stuff I post, people don't really see as much. So it, it is what it is. Uh, that's why I'm really trying to use a lot more on YouTube because you know, it's great for the interaction, I think. And it grows quite a bit. Um, Seth, thank you for the recommendation. Appreciate that. A lot of people here actually who are with me today are former students. So it's nice that people come back and, and mention and talk about things. And um, You know, I actually did a, a search yesterday on me. <laughs> my Me and my class. Uh, because this, this person messaged me on Instagram, I haven't replied just yet, but they're messaging me saying that they saw something on, on Reddit where somebody was taking my work and, and posing it as theirs, which honestly, I really don't care. But anyways, I was just kind of curious. I just wanted to see what they were saying. But apparently somebody was posting on Reddit that my dinosaur drawings were like his drawings. I was like, well, that's kind of funny. I'm going to look it up. And I looked it up and I just typed in my name with dinosaur and drawings and, you know, Reddit posts were coming up about me and my classes. I was like, oh man, people are going to be shit talking to me. Um... But it wasn't that way at all. Everything was all positive. It's like, oh, 
glad it's kind of working. <laughs> glad people kind of like me. Uh, I'm glad it's working some, to some degree. So um, I thought that was kind of funny. But anyways, uh, maybe I'll find that dinosaur post somewhere and kind of laugh at it. But stuff like that doesn't really irk me too much. Um, anyways, so next time hopefully I'll be on is actually maybe even next week when the classes are beginning because around that time it's a little bit light. It's just the first day, first week, so things are just kind of getting ramped up. Uh, so I'd like to be able to do a live stream next week at least once and then have it keep it ongoing even through the term uh, more if I can. If anything else, um, you can follow me on social media on Instagram. You'll see more posts up there. But do look forward to another live stream sometime next week for myself. And I think I'm going to try to do it maybe on a Wednesday or Thursday, usually around that time. Um, but anyways, thank you guys all for the participation, all the questions and comments and all the support. And for those of you that donated, thank you so much. I appreciate that. Uh, and I will see you all next time. Thank you for all the time. And uh, we'll, we'll have more sketching and drawing Q&A as we go forward into the future. And good luck.